A personal message from Robin Sharma. This is a book about the vast genius, decency and heroism that live within every beating heart on our planet today. Creating this work for you has been exhilarating, frightening, inspiring and exhausting. Writing the Everyday Hero Manifesto caused me to go to places within my craft, character and duty to serve well beyond what I'd previously known. On finishing it, I was a different man than when I started the process. On the pages ahead, you'll discover a calibrated philosophy to materialize your finest talents, a revolutionary methodology to produce masterwork, and a steady stream of insights to lead a life of breathtaking beauty, enduring joy and spiritual freedom. I've shared more of myself here than I have in any of my earlier books. Revealing this vulnerability has been a scary yet ultimately satisfying process. Taking an honest look at our failings helps us turn them into wisdom, right? And embracing our hurt allows us to remake it into strength. As you read of all I've gone through, my sincere hope is that you will learn what dangers to avoid, how to turn troubles into triumphs, and of the wonderful way that life always unfolds in your favor, even when it doesn't seem like it. The Everyday Hero Manifesto has been handcrafted for you, as if it were my last book. I hope and pray I get to write many more. Yet a human life is a fragile ride, and none of us know what tomorrow brings. And so I've given you the best I have to give in this manual for supreme productivity, elite performance, sustained happiness and unusual service to society. My genuine and heartfelt wish is that the knowledge you are about to acquire illuminates the gift slumbering within you, electrifies the fire you have to create your magnum opus, and helps you realize your personal magic, so you lead the life you most desire while making our world a better place. With love plus respect, P.S. To access all of the learning models, implementation templates and tactical worksheets mentioned in this book, along with teaching videos to deepen your growth, go to theeveritahairmanifesto.com. Epigraph. Thousands of geniuses live and die undiscovered, either by themselves or by others. Mark Twain. Only those who devote themselves to a cause with their whole strength and soul can be true masters. For this reason, mastery demands all of a person. Albert Einstein. People always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired, but that isn't true. No, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in. The manifesto for the everyday hero within you. If you have not discovered something you would die for, said Martin Luther King Jr., you are not fit to live. I would easily die fighting for the idea that you are great. I would take a bullet for the concept that you are meant to make marvelous works, experience majestic events, and know of the secret universe of mastery that was populated by the advanced souls who walked before us. As a citizen of the earth, you have been called to harness your primal power to do amazing things, to make astonishing progress, and to uplift the lives of your brothers and sisters with whom you caretake the planet. I believe all of this to be truth. No matter where the hands of nature have now placed you, your past need not prescribe your future. Tomorrow can always be made into something better than today. You are human. And this is what humans are able to do. Yes, we show up in different colors, sizes, genders, religions, nationalities, and ways of being. Nelson Mandela, Harriet Tubman, Mahatma Gandhi, Florence Nightingale and Oscar Schindler are heroes of the highest order. Yet those who lead quieter lives, the ones who teach in schools or work in restaurants, write their poetry or launch their startups, pursue their trade in bakeries or parent their children at home, those who help within communities as first responders, firefighters and aid workers, may also be worthy of being called heroes. Many of these good souls do hard jobs, with a noble resolve to do them well. They work with smiles on their faces. And grace in their hearts. I am humbled when my life intersects with such human beings. Truly. I learn from them, I'm uplifted by them, and am somehow transformed upon meeting them. These are everyday heroes. So-called ordinary people conducting themselves in virtuous and honorable ways. And so with sincere respect for all the possibility within you longing to express itself, as we begin our journey together, these words flow as my encouragement to you, starting today, declare your devotion to remembering the sublime soul, brave warrior and undefeatable creator, that your natural wisdom is calling on you to be. The trials of your past, 
have skillfully served to reinvent you into one who is tougher, more aware of the powers that make you special and more grateful for the basic blessings of a life beautifully lived, splendid health, a happy family, a job that fulfills and a hopeful heart. These apparent difficulties have actually been the stepping stones for your current and future victories. The former limits that have shackled you and the failures that have hurt you have been necessary for the realization of your mastery. All is unfolding for your benefit. You truly are favored. Oh yes, whether you accept this or not, you are a lion, not a sheep. A leader, never a victim. A person worthy of exceptional accomplishment, uplifting adventure, flawless contentment and the self-respect that, over time, rises steeply into a reservoir of self-love that no one and no thing can ever conquer. You are a mighty force of nature and a dynamic producer, not a slumbering casualty caught flat-footed in a world of degrading mediocrity, dehumanizing complaint, compliance and entitlement. And with steadfast commitment and regular effort, you will evolve into an idealist, an unusual artist and a potent exceptionalist. A genuine world changer, in your own most honest and excellent way. So be not a cynic, critic and naysayer. For doubters are degenerated dreamers. And average is absolutely unworthy of you. Today, and for each day, that follows of your uniquely glorious, brilliantly luminous and most helpful to many life, stand fiercely in the limitless freedom to shape your future, materialize your ambitions, and magnify your contributions in high esteem of your dreams, enthusiasms, and dedications. Insulate your cheerfulness, polish your prowess, and inspire all witnesses fortunate enough to watch your good example of how a great human being can behave. We will watch your growth, applaud your gifts, appreciate your valor and admire your eventual immortality. As you remain within the hearts of many. 2. Being faithful to your ideals is a force multiplier. When no one believes in you is when you most need to believe in you. Those committed to the fullest expression of their native genius know that self-faith and staying true to yourself and your mighty mission, especially in the face of ridicule and uncertainty, attack and adversity, is the gateway into legendary. And truly a pathway to immortality. Because your noble example will live on long after you're gone. The journey to your most heroic life will be colorful, inspirational, messy, marvelous, tumultuous and most definitely glorious. Dedicating yourself to inhabiting your greatness, generating a vast barrage of beautiful results, and doing your part to build a brighter world will be the wisest and best ride you'll ever take. This, I promise you. And stepping into the immense splendor of your most creative, powerful and compassionate self will energize everyone around you to awaken to their gifts, making our planet a friendlier place. If I may, I'd like to take a moment to share a little about my origin story so you get to know me better. Because we're about to spend a fair amount of time together on these pages. I'm no one special. No guru. Not cut from some special cloth that you can't wear. I have my talents, as you have yours, possess very human flaws, don't we all, and can feel insecure, unworthy and afraid, as well as brave, useful and hopeful. I grew up in a blue-collar town of about 5,000 people. Near the ocean, in a small house. A child of immigrant parents, with very good hearts. I had no silver spoon in my mouth, that's for sure. Full of enthusiasm at age four. Playing in the snow in front of my house. Yes, that's me at a school play. And in our front yard during a very cold winter. See, no Ferrari in the driveway. No lavish adornments or unnecessary things. All very basic. The best way to be. In school, I never fit in with a hip crowd. Always loved being in my own head, dreaming up fascinating dreams, marching to my own drumbeat. Doing my own thing, if you know what I mean. A principal once told my beloved mother that I showed no promise and that it was unlikely I'd graduate from high school. Other teachers quietly warned my parents that I had minimal potential. A few predicted I'd end up as a drifter or a vagrant. Most people simply made fun of me. Except for one. Cor Greenaway. My grade 5 history teacher. She believed in me. Which helped me believe in me. Mrs. Greenaway taught me that every human being is born into some form of giftedness. She explained that each of us can be astonishingly good at something and are born with special strengths, 
remarkable capacities and dignified virtues. She told me that, if I remembered this, worked really hard, and stayed true to myself, good things would happen, and great blessings would follow. This kind teacher saw the best in me, encouraged me and showed a form of decency that is very much needed in a society that all too often demeans our abilities and degrades our mastery. Sometimes, all it takes is one conversation with an extraordinary person to reroute the rest of your life in an entirely new direction, right? A few years ago, I searched for Cora Greenaway online. What I discovered genuinely moved me. As a young woman, she was part of the Dutch resistance, going behind enemy lines in World War II to rescue children facing extermination in Nazi death camps. She risked her life and honored her convictions to save young kids. Just like she saved me. Mrs. Greenaway has since passed on. She died the same year I found out about her past. I thank the gentleman in Amsterdam who so generously cared for her to the end and who kept me updated about this mentor who meant so much to me. Cor Greenaway was what I call an everyday hero. Quiet and humble, mighty and vulnerable, ethical and influential, wise and loving. Improving our civilization, one good deed at a time. She inspired me to transcend the limited expectations that many had placed on my life in Finnish high school. And then complete university, with a major in biology and a minor in English. Then secure a seat in law school. Then earn a master of laws, on a full scholarship. Core Greenaway at age 101. Trust not your detractors. Pay no attention to your diminishers. Ignore your discouragers. They do not know of the wonders within you. In time, I became a successful litigation lawyer. Well paid but empty, driven yet creatively unfulfilled, disciplined yet disconnected from who I really was. I'd wake up every morning, look at myself in the bathroom mirror, and dislike the man looking back at me. I didn't have much hope. And I had no intimacy with the natural heroism that I've since learned is one of the core benefits to being human. Success without self-respect is an empty victory, isn't it? And so, I decided to remake myself. To get to know a truer, happier, more peaceful and better version of the person I was. By starting a campaign of massive personal growth, profound emotional healing, and deep spiritual progress. You absolutely have this power to make tectonic changes too. Evolution, elevation and even outright transformation are part of the factory installed hardware that makes you you. And the more you exercise this inherent force within you, the stronger it will grow. Regenerating a more creative, productive, inventive, and unconquerable version of yourself, one filled with more joy, bravery and serenity, isn't some unreachable gift reserved for the gods of sublime genius and the angels of unusual excellence. No. Genius has far less to do with your genetics and much more to do with your habits. Stepping into the person you've always imagined you could be is a trained result, available to anyone willing to open themselves up, do the work, and run the practices that make magic real. At this period of my life, I set out to rebuild, rewire and recreate the person I was into a human being who drew his power from an inner system of navigation, rather than from outer attractions like position, material goods and prestige. One who did not hold back on speaking truthfully, even when faced with unpopularity, one who stood steadfast to his ideals, one whose job never felt like a job, but more like a calling, one who did not need to purchase things to experience rich pleasure and one who used his days to make the lives of others happier. It's far too easy to spend an entire existence climbing a series of mountains, only to realize at the end that we scaled the wrong ones. By being busy being busy, by being addicted to distractions and seduced by diversions that give us a false sense of progress, yet in reality steal the most valuable hours of our most precious days. By the hypnotic allure of filling our lives with items and activities that our culture sells as the authentic measures of success when, in truth, they are as spiritually satisfying as a quick trip to the nearest shopping mall. My devotion to reforming myself by living more to the point just as I was entering my early 30s makes me think of the words of poet Charles Bukowski, we are all going to die, all of us, what a circus. That alone should make us love each other but it doesn't. We are terrorized and flattened by trivialities, we are eaten up by nothing. 
for a period of three long years, I'd rise early, while my family slept, and experiment with practices that would reduce my weaknesses, purify my powers and more fully align me with my personal destiny. I'd study books on the great men and women of history, the artistic geniuses, the fearless warriors, the prodigious scientists, the business titans and the tireless humanitarians, learning of the central beliefs, dominant emotions, daily routines and ironclad rituals that generated their luminous lives. I'll share everything I discovered on the pages that follow. I attended personal growth conferences and invested in self-development courses. I learned to meditate and visualize, journal and contemplate, fast and pray. I enlisted peak performance coaches, worked with acupuncturists, hypnotherapists, emotional healers and spiritual counselors, took cold showers, sweated in hot saunas and invested in weekly massage therapy. Looking back on it now, as a much older man, I see that it was a lot. I must say that at times the process was confusing, uncomfortable and terrifying. It was also electrifying, fascinating, rewarding and often breathtakingly beautiful. Fundamental personal change is often painful, because it is so very transformational. And we cannot become everything we are meant to be without leaving behind who we once were. The weaker you must experience a death of sorts before the strongest you can know a rebirth. If improvement doesn't feel difficult, it's not real improvement, is it? As I steadily did my own inner work each morning, while the world around me was still sleeping, the way I saw myself, how I behaved, and the very operating system of my life were completely restructured. As I spent time with my dream team of instructors, many of my major fears vanished. So many of my daily worries and sabotaging behaviors simply fell away. Much of my need to please, to be liked, and to follow the herd, while betraying myself, just dissolved. I grew more loyal to my deepest values, far more healthy, creative, cheerful and peaceful. And I spent less time living in my head, and a lot more intimately connected with my heart. This caused my inspiration to soar, my productivity to accelerate and my confidence to escalate. I began to know of a magic that is available to any human being seriously interested in befriending it. Near the end of those three years of almost never-ending healing and consistent growth, I knew I was ready to begin a new phase of the adventure toward personal mastery and leadership that I still find myself on today. Instinct whispered that I should write a book about my experience and the lessons I'd learned. So others could make their rise as well. I called it the monk who sold his Ferrari. Some snickered at the title and suggested that no one would read a self-help book written by a lawyer. Others muttered that the life of an author was hard, so I should give up before I started. I refused to participate in their limitation and very enthusiastically wrote a fable about the path away from a half-lived existence and toward one weighted with wonder, bravery and pure possibility. The process of writing this book was enchanting. I knew little about publishing and didn't come from an entrepreneurial family, mom was a teacher and dad was a family doctor. But I did know that self-education is the highway to making vividly imagined fantasies into readily observed reality. What I didn't know, I could learn. The skills I lacked, I could build. And the results anyone else created, I too, could forge, with focus, strong effort, superb information and good teachers. So I signed up for a one-night course at an organization, called The Learning NX. There, I learned about manuscripts and editors, publishers and printers, distributors and booksellers. The course was amazing, leaving me full of fire to fulfill my dream. After the class finished, I walked home in the cold winter night, as snow fell, feeling profoundly hopeful and extraordinarily committed to getting my book out into the world. I decided to publish the book myself. My wonderful mother edited the manuscript, pouring over each line late into the evenings. A few good friends were my very first readers. I had it printed at a 24-hour copy shop. I still recall my father driving me there at 4 in the morning, so I could advance my mission, before heading to my job as a litigation lawyer by 8. Bless him for his unconditional helpfulness and support, when I most needed it. Due to my inexperience, I didn't realize that making a book from letter, sized manuscript pages would shrink the text. So the first edition was hard to read. No matter, I did my best, 
and began sharing the message of the monk who sold his Ferrari at service clubs in my community. My first seminar, coincidentally run by the Learning Annex, had 23 participants. 21 of them were family members. I kid you not. Lao Tzu was right about that whole the thousand-mile journey begins with a single step thing. I pretty much started as an author from scratch. If you wait for conditions to be perfect before you launch your highest dream, you'll never begin. A famous author agreed to meet with me as I felt I needed further guidance and wished to learn how to reach a larger audience to positively impact more people. Finding a wise mentor truly is priceless as you begin to lead your most heroic life. I wore a suit, brought him a copy of myself, published book and sat on a well-worn leather chair in front of his enormous oak desk as he held court. Robin, he said, this is a hard business. Very few ever make it. He added, you have a good job as a lawyer. You should stay with that and not take a chance on something so uncertain. His words deflated me. Discouraged me. Disappointed me. I thought that perhaps my ambition to get the monk who sold his Ferrari into the hands of readers who would benefit from it was silly. Maybe I'd miscalculated my ability. I'd never written a book. I was unknown. It was a tough field to break into. Maybe the big shot author had a point, I should play it safe and stick. With my career in law. Then a blinding glimpse of the obvious appeared. His opinion was merely his opinion. Why give it any more value? The gentleman's assessment wasn't any of my business, really. Someone was going to write the next bestseller. Why not me? And every professional starts off as an amateur. It seemed to me that I shouldn't let his counsel smother my passion and deny my aspiration. Each day, as I sat in my office as a litigator, I thought to myself, every hour I'm here is an hour away from what I really wish to do and what I know I'm meant to do. I guess my faith was larger than my fears and my daring was stronger than my doubts. I pray you always trust your intuition over the cool and practical reasoning of your intellect. Your possibility, mastery and genius do not live there. People now say I was brave to persevere in the face of dissent and challenge. It wasn't bravery at all. To be honest, as I always want to be, and absolutely will be during our time together, I felt I had no choice but to follow where my enthusiasm was leading me. People living deeply have no fear of dying, wrote in Asnin. Norman Cousins observed that the great tragedy of life is not death, but what we allow to die inside of us while we live. I share these quotes to remind you of the shortness and frailty of life. Too many of us postpone doing those things that make our soul come alive until some imaginary ideal time arrives. It never comes. There's no better time to become the human being you know you can be and handcraft the life of your most exuberant desires than now. The world could completely change tomorrow. History has shown this to be true. Don't live your finest hours in the waiting room of life. Please. It's wiser to take a chance and risk looking foolish, yet know that you did it, than miss the opportunity and end up empty and heartbroken, on your last day. So I took the monk who sold his Ferrari to a respected editor with the intent of making it better. Good writing takes hard hard work. Unfortunately, good writing looks easy. It isn't. On reading the editor's note, I sat in my car, hardly moving, heart pounding, palm sweating, in front of his red brick house with neatly trimmed hedges. My manuscript sat on the seat next to me with elastic bands around it. I still remember the scene in detail. And I recall how I felt. Embarrassed. Rejected. Dejected. He sort of broke my heart on that sunny day. And yet instinct really is wiser than intellect. And all. Real progress has come from daydreamers who were told by so-called experts that their consuming idea was foolish and their creative work was unworthy. Please protect your respect for yourself and for your most honest artistry above the fear-fueled, impossibility-filled pronouncements of people who are masters of theory, yet creators of nothing. Some voice or strength or wisdom within me, coming from a place far higher than logic, instructed me, do not listen to him. Just like the famous author who didn't encourage you, this letter is just this editor's view. Keep going. Your honor and self-love depends on your determination and loyalty to your mission. And so I continued. 
as I really 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 hope you will do when you get knocked down and a little, or a lot, beaten up, bruised and bloodied. Setbacks are simply life's way of testing how much you desire your dreams, aren't they? As Theodore Roosevelt said in a speech entitled Citizenship in a Republic, delivered at the Sorbonne in Paris on April 23, 1910, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Life really does favor the obsessed. Great fortune truly does shine on those mesmerized by their gorgeous ambitions. And the universe most definitely supports the human being unwilling to surrender to the forces of fear, rejection and self-doubt. A few months after publishing the book, I was in a local bookstore with my son, who was four years old at the time. Much credit is due to him, because it was his love of hammers, tape measures and other carpentry tools, he'd wear his checkered work shirt, yellow plastic hard hat and fake leather tool belt to nearly every meal at our dinner table, that led us to the hardware store next to the bookshop. It was a rainy night, with a luxurious full moon, that forecast a good omen. I do remember it well. Once inside the bookstore, we headed directly to the section where my book was displayed. I'd given the owner six copies on consignment, which means if he couldn't sell them, he could return them. Another self-published author had shared a key piece of advice, once a book has been signed by the author, the retailer must keep it. So I had a practice of visiting every place that carried the monk who sold his Ferrari and personally autographing every single copy. I collected the six copies from the shelf and headed to the front area, where I politely asked permission to sign my book. The cashier approved, and with my young son perched on the wooden counter before me, I used one arm to steady him and the other to sign my utterly unknown book. The counter in the bookstore. As I signed my name, I noticed an observer, wearing a green trench coat still wet from the rain, standing off to the side. He watched every move I made. After a few minutes, the man approached me and said, speaking very precisely, the monk who sold his Ferrari. That's a great title. Tell me about yourself. I explained that I was a lawyer. That I'd been frustrated and unhappy a number of years earlier because I was living someone else's life. I shared that I'd discovered valuable ways to live more happily, more confidently, more productively and access far more aliveness. I said that I had a deep drive to get my book to as many human beings as possible and to serve society as best as I could. I added that I'd published the book in an all-night copy shop and that I'd been ridiculed and criticized and minimized as I pursued my project. He looked at me. He studied me. He waited for what seemed a long time. Then he pulled out his wallet and handed me his business card. On it were these words, Edward Carson, President. HarperCollins Publishers. Synchronicity is destiny's way of staying silent, right? Three weeks later, HarperCollins bought the world rights to the monk who sold his Ferrari. For 7,500. The book has gone on to become one of the best-selling books of all time, serving many millions of good human beings across our precious world in the process. And so, as I round out this chapter, I encourage you to consider the ethical ambitions that sit silently in your heart, waiting to be made real. I ask you to wonder how you can be the core greenaway of someone's life and the kind of human who makes people braver when they stand in your presence. I invite you to go to the threshold of the fears that shame you, explore the boundaries that bind you and notice all the past hurts that now stop you and rise above it all. For this day presents your new dawn and our world awaits your everyday heroism. 3. The final hours of your defeatable self. Drinking coffee. Trip-hop music's playing. A harsh winter has finally made way for a more welcoming spring. 
I sit in my writing room, a place that I go to when I'm set to work. I'll share the scene, to make this more intimate, one of my favorite spaces for creativity at home. I'm in a reflective mood today. As I often am, as an introvert. I think of the individuals I've met over the nearly three decades I've been in the leadership and personal mastery field. At private speaking events for Fortune 100 companies, or on the streets of faraway cities, or in sprawling arenas in fascinating countries across our completely worth-saving planet. Decent people. Superb intentions. Yet so many sharing so clearly with me during our conversations, that they long for so much more. To know what it means, to candidly express their creative genius, enjoy life's treasures and contribute to the construction of a culture where encouragement not criticism, leadership not victimhood, ideas not gossip, and love not hate win the day. To feel more optimism, be more daring, and know greater purpose, while understanding what it truly means to feel supremely inspired, living in the moment instead of scarred from the past or frightened for the future. To reclaim a relationship with their truest virtues, grandest potential and most vivid ambitions. And to pass through each day with enough wakefulness to savor life's simplest pleasures, without the burden of worry. You're wise, perhaps even more than you know, at this instant we share. Do you understand that potential unexpressed turns to pain? You know that the measures of success, that society sells you are empty promises, that only serve to distract you from the crusade toward your bravest life. You appreciate that the closer you get to your fortune, the louder your fears will scream. You are aware, that the project, that your counterfeit self is most avoiding is precisely the venture your noblest self seeks to be advancing. You get that world class really is less about your genetics and more about your habits and that all heavyweight producers work really really hard. You know that the clock is ticking, and that mastery postponed is genius denied. You know that you just can't afford to wait another day, to step into the hero you've always imagined yourself being. And so, I respectfully suggest that you make your start today. Develop the guts to play out on the edges of your powers. Because as you visit your limits, those limits will expand. Activate the childlike part of you that was once wildly curious, and constantly learning before you were schooled to play small, and trained to think like everyone else, so that you continually outgrow the person you currently are. Gauge your winning by the extent of your progress, and never by the objects in your closets. Lead without a title, influence without a position, and create the masterwork that exemplifies the promise that nature has invested in you. And remember that the easiest path is generally the poorest route. And that action delayed is greatness betrayed. 4. It's okay not to be okay. Our civilization sells us the idea that if we're not smiley and happy, and if puppies aren't dancing, and rainbows do not stream into the window panes of perfect days, something's wrong with us. Here's what I've learned, an intensely lived life requires getting into the arena, taking multiple risks, pursuing numerous paths, getting knocked around a fair amount and dealing with the stormy gales of treacherous seas more than makes rational sense. These words by Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw offer me inspiration on difficult days, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world, the unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. I've also realized that it's because of the tough and tumultuous times we all endure that we are actually able to fully experience the pleasures of the good times when they show up. And they always will, even when it seems that they won't. We could never learn to be brave and patient if there were only joy in the world, Helen Keller taught us. I must admit that when things don't go my way, it can be unpleasant. I don't laugh as much and I worry more. I'm not as energetic or as creative. I don't have the same productive exuberance and can't access the same fire in the belly. Yet I've learned that not feeling absolutely okay is absolutely okay. That when we are not experiencing the kind of worldly productivity valued by the majority, we are very likely advancing our spiritual productivity. A difficult day for the ego is a splendid day for the soul. And setback, struggle and being stuck in confusion are part of being a human, never to be judged as bad and wrong. It's just a necessary pit stop on the journey that we're meant to experience during this ride we call a lifetime. 
I've discovered that all that I'm living during an uncomfortable season is serving the acceleration of my wisdom, forging priceless strength and then masking human powers in the hot coals of crisis. Pain has served to make me more humble and definitely more loving by degrading my ego and fortifying my private heroism. It's simply a scheduled class in the curriculum of Earth School. A chapter in the life of a man reaching for the heavens and doing all he can to raise others with him. I'd rather get confused, bruised a bit, or a lot, and know that I'm living fully than spend my greatest years watching television in a subdivision or buying things I don't need to impress people I don't know in a store I don't really want to be in. That's just not me. Not what I wish to represent. So my sincere and truthful encouragement to you a very real person dedicated and destined to lead a gorgeous, productive and high-impact life is to wear your wounds with pride. Defend the scars that have deepened, developed and refined you. And see the cuts that have hurt you as medals of valor awarded for your courage as you've pursued your deep goals and lofty ideals. And definitely remember, it's okay not to be okay. 5. The Gold Miner's Paradox. Old yet true story. Thousands of years ago, in Thailand, a towering statue of the Buddha was made of gold. The monks would pray before it, people would behold its beauty, and all passers-by would revere the remarkable masterpiece. Then, word spread of a coming great invasion from foreign attackers, and it became clear the idol could be stolen. So, the monks hatched a plan to hide it, placing layer after layer of soil over the golden Buddha. Until it became unrecognizable. The invaders marched right by it, to the relief of the monks. Centuries later, a visitor caught a glimmer of gold emerging from a small mountain of earth. As more people dug away at the covering, more gold appeared. Eventually, they found that it was the Buddha, made completely of the precious metal. You are like this. The more you advance, layer by layer, into the treasures of your inner gifts, the more you will be rewarded with unexpected bounty in your external reality. It's quite a paradox, isn't it? To know that the gateway into success and significance in your public life requires you to take an inner voyage into the depths of your private world. So that you own all that you truly are. With more of the interior work that delivers self-knowledge, more of the gold you have covered to insulate yourself against life's hardships and troubles will reappear. With more daily practice to mine your gifts, refine your talents, and reveal your eminence, all you are built to be will show itself when you are out in the world. While in Bangkok for a leadership presentation for a quickly growing company, I went to see the astonishing landmark of the Golden Buddha. Here's the photo from my personal archive in Bangkok with the Golden Buddha. The insight I'm really attempting to offer you is that, just maybe, the pursuit of anyone seeking to materialize their magnificence, live fearlessly and beautifully, and achieve feats that upgrade our global family isn't to become someone other than who you now are. What if the real endeavor is simply to remember what you once were, before a cold culture encouraged you to cover your light with the armor of doubt, disbelief and false reasons about why you cannot express your primal genius. And make your life a monument. To mastery, productivity and sincere service to humanity. 6. The Victim to Hero Leap one of the main messages that I hope this work will integrate within you, at a cellular level, is this, every day, each one of us is presented with an enormous opportunity to shift from any form of victimhood into everyday heroism. So that nearly every move you make as the hours unfold is a vote for the fullest realization of personal greatness. To materialize your mastery and to lead your finest life, I invite you to make the following five leaps. Please allow me to walk you through each one, leap one, the shift from a mindset of Kent to the mentality of can. Victims are prisoners of Kent. They relentlessly tell you why an ideal can't succeed, why an enterprise can't work, and why an ambition can't happen. Beneath Kent lives fear. Fear of failing, fear of not being good enough, fear of not deserving victory, fear of being criticized, fear of getting hurt, and fear of the imagined responsibilities of success. All world builders and change leaders are experts at using the language of hope, the vocabulary of execution and the dialect of freedom. They avoid being infected with can't. They understand that the words you deploy are your thoughts made verbal. And that creating a masterwork, initiating a movement or engineering a gorgeous life require the positive energy of can. 
Doubters and defeated thinkers never become history makers. The victim to hero leap. One of my favorite movies is Darkest Hour, a film about Winston Churchill's ascent into becoming a legendary wartime leader. In the final scene, he delivers a spirited speech that enchants those on both sides of the political aisle of parliament. Lord Halifax, Churchill's nemesis, was stunned by the delivery of Churchill's vocal magic and asked the colleague sitting next to him, what just happened? The reply? He mobilized the English language and sent it into battle. Yes, the words you use are seeds for the harvest you reap. Words are powerful. They have been used to inspire and free entire nations. And when spoken with evil motives, they have influenced masses of humans to become soldiers of hate. When you listen to someone with a philosophy of mediocrity, they demonstrate victim speak, speaking negatively, arguing for why they cannot represent heroism in the primary areas of their life. They'll explain why they can't be graceful in trying times, optimize their performance regardless of the conditions, be a great example to others, get ultra-fit, build their fortune and make their mark. Kant is a tower that victims lock themselves into, in the prayer, that this will protect them from the danger or risk. Yet in so doing, they avoid all the abundant rewards that inevitably flow from thoughtful, versus ill-considered, risk-taking. The other day I watched a man on television complain that the government wasn't doing enough to support him to ensure his small business would flourish and to make his life easier. I can't see any solution to this situation, and I can't survive in this turbulent environment," he grumbled. Hmm. Not judging, at all, yet it seems to me that this good soul expected a power outside of his own to make his aspirations come true. And as far as I can tell, this isn't how the universe works. It doesn't reward those who blame their circumstances when things aren't working and passively wait for outside help. Nope. It celebrates those who demonstrate agency over difficulty and remake problems into winning. Life loves those everyday heroes who understand that they possess abilities, capabilities and the force to shape all events that destiny carefully places on their path. The words you use have major force fields around them, attracting outcomes that resonate with them the way magnets draw iron filings to them. Also know that the words we use each day reveal our most entrenched beliefs to everyone around us, even if those beliefs don't serve us, they may even be pure lies that someone we trusted early in our lives taught us. In my own life, I regularly use the technique of auto-suggestion to reorder my vocabulary toward greater positivity and creativity. Very early in the morning, while my subconscious mind is most available to receiving instructions, I'll recite mantras such as today I am showing up with enthusiasm, excellence, and kindness or I am so very grateful for the day ahead and all its beauty, joys and excitements. During the day, should my mind and heart drift to a hurt of the past or some negative self-talk that dishonors my best, I'll quietly whisper, we don't do this anymore or let's not go there. I get this may seem strange, but because I really want to serve you, I'm sharing this personal practice that has worked so well for me. So make the leap to bring greater awareness to the language you use along with the thoughts you think. And then, with that heightened consciousness, begin the process of cleaning out all can't and reprogramming in the power of can. Reordering your vocabulary toward leadership and exceptionalism is one of the simplest yet most potent ways to escalate your confidence, performance and impact in the world. Leap 2, the shift from making excuses to delivering results. You can make excuses, or you can change our world. You don't get to do both. You can spot a victim by watching how they have a near instant reason to explain why their life is not working, which never has anything to do with them. Such people have recited these excuses so many times they have actually brainwashed themselves into believing they are true. They have practiced their rationalization so extremely well they've risen to pro-athlete level at offering up their explanations for their mediocrity. Your experience shifts the single moment when you fully appreciate that blaming conditions, events and other human beings for any poverty in your reality gives your power to the condition, event or person that you are portraying as the cause of your discontent. We grow up the instant we assume absolute personal responsibility for the way our results look. And, in so doing, we take back our sovereignty 
to make the improvements we seek. Every time you restrain yourself from descending into an excuse, and instead view yourself as the creator of your life, you'll receive a corresponding increase in strength. Do this daily, and you'll become an individual of outstanding character, self-discipline, productivity and spiritual liberty. Leap 3, the shift from living in the past to making a brighter future. Victims are fabulous at living in the past. Yet you cannot embrace your fantastic future with one foot stuck. In a bygone era. See your history as an academy you can learn from versus a jail to stay chained in. Employ selective amnesia to remember only the good you've been blessed to enjoy. Let go of simmering resentments and languishing disappointments, while exploiting the exquisite growth that hard events have brought to make you a bolder producer and a better person. In all my mentoring work with industry titans, sports icons and genuine world builders, every single one of them developed the skill of using all that happened to them as fuel to rise even higher. Each one of these superstars made the mission-critical leap from ruminating about the past to optimizing the kind of world-class present that precedes a mastery-grade future. Leap 4, the shift from being busy being busy to becoming productive. Please don't confuse being busy with being productive. And definitely don't assume movement equals progress. A packed schedule doesn't mean you're getting marvelous things done. Too many good and potentially legendary performers fall into the trap of doing fake work instead of real work. These things are not the same. To a victim, busyness becomes a drug of choice, an escape that fills their hours with superficiality and triviality in an unconscious effort to avoid the discomfort that comes with creating towering work that respects human genius. It's so much easier to deceive yourself into thinking you have too much to do, and then blame your lack of artistic victory and productive triumph on a hard and cruel world demanding your attention than to own your game by blocking out all digital distractions and unnecessary interruptions and honoring your native brilliance by doing work that mesmerizes all who witness it. Leap 5, the shift from taking from the world to giving to the world. Listen not to the wisdom of the status quo, which says that success means winner takes all. Rather than taking from the world, make it your consistent enthusiasm to give to the world and to behave in a way that serves all citizens. Members of the majority mostly live in scarcity, the fear that there is not enough for everyone to be happy. They are servableists, stuck in limbic hijack, driven by their ancient brain rather than by the greater wisdom of their higher thinking. To experience the rewards that possibility has in store for you, keep reinforcing the mantra that the one who enriches the most people wins. And let generosity, along with the virtue of ongoing service to many, guide the remainder of your life. Stateswoman Golda Meir once wrote, Trust yourself. Create the kind of self you will be happy to live with all your life. Make the most of yourself by fanning the tiny inner sparks of possibility into flames of higher achievement. And applying the five elements of the victim to hero leap, the trust you have in yourself will grow your intimacy with your special talents and finest merits will be amplified and you will restore the relationship with that side of you that is sure of your capacity to translate your current wishes into colossal success, personally, professionally, financially, and spiritually. Yes, I agree that the process will not always be easy. Why does our society celebrate that which is easy? Yet do remember that pursuits that don't push you will never improve you. And those activities that are hardest to do are generally the most valuable to do. And that fear always screams loudest when your magic is closest. So press ahead with a mighty wisdom that good things happen to people who do good things while sharing your treasures with us all. 7. That time my private journals were taken. Without getting into the gory details and making sure to protect the dignity of those involved, who were operating as best they knew about how to behave, I would like to tell you about the time nine years' worth of my private journals were borrowed from me. All my dream charts and learning sheets that recorded the knowledge I'd gathered were in them. All the deep emotional processing and the substantial healing from heartbreak, hard times and other disappointments were documented within these daily diaries. All the collages of my ideal life, my most vulnerable personal introspections and the steady contemplations on my most needed growth, all taken. And all my general creative observations, 
insights from my world travels, the notes from my mastermind conversations and tens of thousands of micro lessons gained from days, lived as well as I could, simply vanished. In one day. In a single morning, to be precise. The universe has a hilarious sense of humor, doesn't it? So, when people ask me, Robin, I love your methodologies around journaling to boost optimism, authenticity, gratefulness, expertise and spiritual freedom, but what if someone sees what I write? I answer from a place of extreme experience. I reply, why does it matter? They'll see a human being, leading a life. Both hopeful and scared. Fantastic and flawed. Certain as well as confused. Working on themselves. To become a closer version of their highest vision. How brave. And how glorious. This splendid loss taught me to let go, one of the most prized skills one can ever learn during this earth walk you and I are on. This betrayal increased my ability to accept what is, and make peace with whatever happens. It helped me to know how to detach, and release control over whatever unfolds. To disidentify with what others might think of me, if they're at about my fears and failings, as well as of my prayers, aspirations and assets. The best, any reader of my personal reflections will see a man on the path. Someone who works harder on himself than anyone in any room I'm in. A human being who fiercely wishes to evolve, so as to become more honorable, decent, helpful and compassionate. And perhaps, one day, even noble. At worst, an onlooker will learn of my errors, read of my frustrations, spy on my bruises, and judge me as broken. And guess what? To my philosophy, this just makes me real. Awake. And alive. I know of so many celebrities, renowned leaders and so-called gurus who, when the stage lights dim, are not at all who they've branded themselves to be. It was all illusion, sharp marketing and a terrific sales job. Writing intimately in a journal nearly daily has helped me ascend, refined my self-understanding, magnified my creativity considerably, upgraded my emotional fluency, hardwired a near-constant sense of gratitude, and removed many of the stains that had been set on my soul. Candidly, the practice has pretty much saved my life. What I've written on those pages, between those black leather covers, details my private purification process my training to forge a more muscular character and become a true servant leader. My attempts to release, rather than suppress any negativity and toxicity trapped within me. All my journals provide an archive of the adventure of my greatest self quietly and incrementally triumphing over my insecure and fearful side. If a brother or sister of our big family that inhabits this tiny planet seeks to condemn me or mock me, or downgrade their impression of me on learning of my frailties and faults, then, well, that's just fine with me. Actually, their behavior is on them. It really has zero to do with me. None of my business. My favorite line from the film Shoot the Messenger, look inside anyone's life and you'll see a three-ring circus. A three-ring circus. I'm looking inside anyone's life. Full of color and comedy, surprises and acrobatics, a little tightrope walking in the dangerous seasons, as well as a ton of wonder and awe during the days in the sun. 8. Instruction from Heavyweight Mentors I pray this message, which I'm writing to you on a flight across the Atlantic, finds you in pristine focus around your craft, in single-minded pursuit of your summits of excellence, and in steadfast readiness to make your mark on the world, while you sculpt a life of happiness, sophistication, serenity, and usefulness that you'll feel proud of at the end. I've been fortunate to have had many superb mentors in my life. As a lawyer in my early 20s, I worked for a leading judge of immense integrity, rare discipline and unforgettable humility. He was revered in the field, Harvard-trained, brilliant and a genuine model of mastery. Yet his life was quite austere. The car he drove, for example, was simple, unremarkable and many years old. This gentleman chose not to be invested in trivial things. Because he was a heavyweight. After he retired, we kept in touch. He'd send me thoughtful handwritten letters in the mail, thanking me for the various books I'd send him. Unfailingly, he would appreciate my progress and congratulate me on my advances as an author and leadership advisor. His graciousness always made me feel bigger than I was and better than I am. His decency inevitably left me even more hopeful. 
such was the greatness of this man. I'd look forward to those notes, with my name and address carefully etched on the outside of the envelope, in the ink of his ancient fountain pen. My final visit with one of my greatest mentors, Chief Justice Lorne O. Clark. When he was nearing his mid-80s, during a period of my life, that was overscheduled with international speaking tours, book deadlines and family commitments, I decided to put everything on hold and hop onto a plane to visit this human being who had influenced me so much. I didn't want to lose the chance to see him again. Over cups of strong tea, we recalled our time together, laughed hearty laughs and chatted about a wide range of topics that were of interest to both of us. Before I left, I asked my elderly mentor, What's the most important piece of advice you have for me as I go forward, Chief Justice Clark? He paused for a few moments. And then he replied softly, Always be kind, Robin. Oh, that's so important. Always be kind. Then he did something he'd never done in all the years we'd known each other, he leaned over and gave me a hug, adding, I love you, Robin. Two months later, this legal giant and truly great public servant passed away. Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, has also been a terrifically influential mentor to me. I met him in Zurich when he was a member of my faculty at the Titan Summit, a live event for global leaders and elite entrepreneurs that I ran for many years. Although he was an icon, Woz arrived at the summit alone, was impeccably polite, and was as approachable as a dear friend. During our interview on stage, he revealed his winning formula as a visionary and a technologist, shared little-known insights about the real source of Steve Jobs' mastery, and invited all of us, not only to commit to becoming the best in the world at what we do, but also to treat each person we meet with exceptional courtesy and extraordinary respect. We kept in touch for many years, and I grew to consider him, not only a guide, but a much-valued friend. Backstage at the Titan Summit in Zurich, with Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak. Although I've been honored to be a mentor to many well-known billionaires, NBA, NFL and MLB sports legends, and the leadership teams of organizations such as Nike, FedEx, Oracle, Starbucks, Unilever, and Microsoft, if you ask me who has been the number one influence on my life, I'd say, that's easy my father. Dad was born to a simple family in Jammu, Kashmir, with a priest for a father and a saint as his mother. A gifted student, according to my uncle, his brother, my father had to eclipse roughly 10,000 competitors to secure a place at medical school in Agra, India, the home of the Taj Mahal. When it came time to travel there to begin his medical studies, he and his elder brother walked a full day and then traveled by train for three days to arrive at the college, only to be informed by the authorities that his spot had been given to someone else. Dejected but not defeated, they pleaded with the head of the university for an admission, given my father's superb academic record. Dad would never tell you this, given his humility to a fault, yet my uncle once confirmed he was completely brilliant. After much discussion, Dad was finally granted entry. Which led him to finish his medical degree and move to Africa, where he met my mother, and I was made. Work for the Ugandan government as a field doctor, one day he crossed paths in the jungle with the dictator Idi Amin. My mom says she saved my father's life that day. But that's another story, perhaps for a future book. Raise a healthy family, my brother is a widely respected eye surgeon. My father, and my very wise mother, mean the world to me. For 54 years, dad contributed to the community as a family doctor. For decade after decade, he helped those in need, even paying for medicine himself where a patient could not afford it. And year after year, he'd offer me weighty philosophy that shaped me deeply. Me and my parents in the garden. In the spirit of helpfulness, I wanted to share the single best lesson I've learned from my father. It's a simply profound one and a profoundly simple one, like all great truths. Serve others. Too many in our uncertain age behave in selfish, entitled and undignified ways that harm our society and degrade our planet. Too many have forgotten that we really do belong to just one family, on a very insignificant sphere, in a universe with 200 billion galaxies and 2 trillion stars. Too many measure winning by accumulating, do not know the meaning of enough, and maneuver through their lives, as if apprenticed to Machiavelli. Too many have been brainwashed into believing 
that the one who takes the most receives the best. Really? What if the riches that flow as you increase the value you lavish on others, rise in your commitment to helpfulness, and dramatically elevate your contribution to anyone in need, whether that's a relative or a friend, a customer or a supplier, a neighbor or a total stranger. Generous rewards, such as flawless happiness, enduring serenity and increasing self-love, come from knowing you are living your life for a mission much larger than yourself. Serve others, my father would say to me and my brother. Often. And sometimes, with his medical text stacked next to him as he sat on his favorite chair in our living room, he would add, this is the secret to a good life, boys. To reinforce the point, Dad wrote the following poem of Rabindranath Tagore onto the cardboard backing of his prescription pad and taped it to the door of the refrigerator in our kitchen so we would see it before we went off to school each morning. Spring has passed. Summer has gone. And winter is here. And the song that I meant to sing remains unsung. For I have spent my days stringing and then stringing my instrument. To me, this verse reminds us that life's too short not to go all in that each of us has music that must not be stifled within us. And that becoming busy just being busy and allowing your hours to be consumed by unimportant pursuits is violently disrespectful to your natural genius. The words also make me think of the duty each of us carries within us to be of service. They speak of an obligation to lift up others in a civilization that too often tears people down. They note our collective responsibility to deploy our days in a style that reduces the injustice, mistreatment and hatred in our current culture and replaces it with goodwill to all. And a lot more honor. My father, my greatest mentor, wrote a letter to me while I was a young lawyer. I have engraved some of the words that I read onto my heart. And I need to share them with you. When you were born, you cried while the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way that when you die, the world cries while you rejoice. 9. The joy of being laughed at. This is a short chapter, meant for visionaries, dreamers and misfits. As you execute on your ambitions and materialize your farsighted aspirations, the trolls will come out to play. As you live your truth and fully reveal your giftedness, critics will mumble and cynics will grumble. As you bring your previously dormant empires of productivity, prosperity and impact into full waking reality, the naysayers will laugh at you and try to stop you. And yet all history makers were initially ridiculed before they were revered. The very nature of a brave ideal and the fiery hope to make it happen means you'll stand out from the crowd, be called weird, and cause the majority of society to feel threatened by your creative power. This will manifest as jealousy, mockery and sometimes even vicious attack. Remember, please, that those who try to stun your dreams are revealing their limitations, not yours. So continue at all costs. You must not surrender in the face of their insecurities and stuckedness. For the failure to perform right action means the triumph of the mean-spirited, the ungenerous and those who would rather view everyone in darkness than to see all shine brightly. 10. The Orson Welles Memo. Orson Welles is widely regarded as one of the most advanced filmmakers of all time. He made Citizen Kane. He directed and narrated the extraordinary radio adaptation of the H.G. Wells novel The War of the Worlds, which generated widespread hysteria as listeners, believing that the Earth was truly under attack by extraterrestrials, ran for cover. He reinvented the way movies were made through the use of his unusual camera angles, eclectic sound techniques and the long takes that became his trademark. Yet what I most admire about Orson Welles is his artistic integrity and his dedication to flawlessness as a creative leader. After three months in the cutting room, ensuring that his film Touch of Evil would be a tour de force, Wells was barred by the studio from working any further on the project. He was always seen as an outsider by the Hollywood establishment and frequently had a hard time getting movies made. Wells understood the frustration people had around his perfectionism, saying, I could work forever on the editing of a film. I don't know why it takes me, so much time, but that has the effect of arousing the ire of the producers, who then take the film out of my hands. A few months after he was removed, Wells saw the cut of Touch of Evil done by the studio. He grew so distressed that the quality of the movie did not reflect his standards of excellence that 
even though he was no longer involved or being paid, he wrote a memo to the head of production, detailing, with monumental precision, the edits that were needed. The document was 58 pages long. I've read it. And it's breathtaking. The technical expertise it reveals, the attention to the most seemingly minor points it displays, and the respect for the insulation of his good name it shows are astounding. And of great inspiration to anyone serious about making work that lasts. The suggestions were discarded by the producer. And Touch of Evil was released as it was. It remained on the market in that version for 18 years, until the memo was discovered and published in Film Quarterly, where it came to the attention of a director who idolized Orson Welles. He took on a re-edit, so the film would be truer to the original vision of the pioneer behind it. The critics loved it. Yet, to me, the real victory was not in the re-release of the movie, but in the writing of that memo. Which confirms that the making of a masterpiece is much less about the cash to be made and much more about the character of the creator. 11. Nothing's perfect. I was in San Jose, Costa Rica, staying at a stylish boutique hotel situated by a lovely waterway. On checkout, the young woman at the front desk politely asked, how was your stay? Perfect, I hope. Then, before I could answer, she interrupted herself with, of course, nothing's perfect. Hmm. Nothing's perfect. What a wise insight. In nature, no sandbank, no garden, no crooked brook, no fragrant flower, and no lush forest is perfect. Same for life, because it's governed by the same natural laws. You won't find anything that is absolutely perfect. Ever. And once you accept this, you'll find the way things are a whole lot easier to manage. You'll exist with far more cheerfulness, peacefulness and spiritual genius. Nothing you work on will ever be perfect, even if it's your magnum opus. I'm sure Michelangelo, in hindsight, would have changed a few strokes on the fresco of the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel, and that Leo Tolstoy would have structured war and peace slightly differently, given a second chance, and that Marie Curie would have reimagined a number of her scientific innovations, on further reflection. No business will ever be perfect, even if your merchandise is magnificent, and you've selected epic performers for your team. No dinner at a restaurant will ever be perfect, even if it's the most exquisite meal you've ever had. No pair of shoes, cake at a bakery, film you watch on TV, or sports match between top players will ever be perfect. And no personal relationship will be perfect. Because I've yet to meet the perfect person. But here's the wonderful thing the more you embrace this understanding around the imperfection of all things, the more you will pretty nearly automatically start to see the magic within the messy. You'll begin to see the chemistry, and outright alchemy, in objects and experiences and humans that are flawed. You'll learn to trust that it's all perfect because of its imperfection. In Japan, people fix broken pottery pieces by putting them back together with pure gold, a 400-year-old practice called kintsugi. It fascinates me tremendously that the once damaged piece becomes stronger at the broken places. Even more importantly, the method celebrates the truth that something with faults can be reconceived as something even more valuable. And would this not be a perfect thing? 12. The Chestnut Cellar Doctrine. One night, in a fabled European city, I walked the cobblestone streets alone. I watched tourists coming out of posh restaurants, studied the carefully arranged mannequins in the windows of luxury shops, and marveled at the way the moonbeams illuminated the roofs of the ethereal cathedrals. In one square sat a lonely figure, he was hunched over a stove that heated chestnuts. Doing his work like it was the most important job in the world. A gentle smile was radiating from his wrinkled face, though it was nearly midnight. I stopped. I bought a bag of nuts. I asked him to tell me his story. I then asked a few questions about his family. I wondered about the struggles of his life's journey. And what led him to end up in this square. It's late. It's cold. The streets are pretty quiet now. Why are you still here at your chair, selling your chestnuts? I asked the middle-aged vendor with a blue woolen cap on his head. He looked at me, silently. I used to be a very successful businessman in my home country, he replied. Then I got sick and lost everything. My company, my house and my money. But I can still work, 
Thank God. I can still make my life better. I can still make people happy by giving them these chestnuts that I roast with a lot of love. I'm still alive, so I can still dream. I'm still alive, so I can still dream, the chestnut seller repeated. The chestnut seller who made no excuses. I have had dreams and I've had nightmares. I have conquered my nightmares because of my dreams, said Jonas Salk, the iconic scientist and developer of the polio vaccine. Every human being with a thumping pulse and throbbing heart has spellbinding power within them. An ability to transform ideals into results, setbacks into successes and promise into prowess. Unfortunately, the majority of people have been taught to disown this for so often they've forgotten they have it. Here was this man. He'd endured tragedy. Been knocked down badly and beaten up by destiny, pretty seriously. And yet rather than complaining, condemning and doing little with his ability, like an impotent victim licking the hurts of his past and wallowing in self-pity, here he was, smiling, working, helping and doing his part to upgrade his reality. Beautiful. Heroic, actually. And if he continues with such resolve and passion for his occupation, I have no doubt that he'll soon hire others to help him expand his venture at multiple locations, and, should he stay true to the opportunity he has seized, he may in time even purchase a chestnut farm and build a series of chestnut processing factories, employing many and perhaps finally retiring to pursue philanthropy. Who knows? Sure, fortune has its script and much of what we live has been written by the guardian of fate. And yet as human beings we have been blessed with immense gifts and striking power to shape our future. My experience with a chestnut seller of robust character makes me think of what I call the tale of two restaurants. In a romantic European city favored by lovers sit two restaurants. They are across the street from each other. They serve the same type of food and from a quick glance they look fairly similar. Yet one always has a long line outside it. Every single evening. The other? Mostly empty tables. Interesting, right? I would bet that the owner of the empty place has a thousand seductive justifications and one million attractive excuses for why his restaurant isn't popular. My guess is they're just lucky, or they have a better location or I can't find a great chef, or it's hard to find good workers, or the economy makes it impossible for me to succeed, would be high on his list. Not one of these excuses would be a statement of truth. They just make the owner feel better about the empty tables. The reality is the acclaimed restaurant found a way to sparkle. As could the place across the street. Yet giving away one's power is a whole lot easier. Coasting along with tiny commitment to expertise, a weak work ethic, and no fire to create something special is simpler. And blaming the stars for any poverty of mastery and mediocre circumstances just makes a human being feel safer. Because taking absolute personal responsibility over our actions and the consequences that flow from them demands that you wage war against your dragons and do battle with your demons. This requires extreme courage and profound wisdom, which few are willing to develop. And yet to have the results very few have, you must do the things very few do. We don't really get lucky in life. We create lucky. Once we operate in the correct way. I suggest that, this day, you promise yourself to let virtuosity be your lamplight, diligence be your north star, integrity be your lighthouse and the lifelong pursuit of greatness be your compass. And when you feel like giving up and are in need of some honest inspiration, please remember my friend the chestnut seller. The one with the blue woolen cap. 13. The IPA principle for accelerated positivity. Your ecosystem shapes your energy. And your surroundings influence your performance. Dramatically. Everything outside you profoundly affects the way you think, feel, create and execute. Everything. Your personal ecosystem includes the people you have conversations with, the influencers you follow, the media you consume, the books you read, the food you eat, the tools of the trade you use, the transportation you take, the place you live and the spaces you visit. It all works in concert to either lift you to legendary or reduce you to ordinary. Which brings me to the IPA principle, input positivity and you'll output positivity. You can't spend hours each day watching the news, which is designed to scare you into watching more, 
rather than showing you the immense good unfolding in the world at this very moment, follow celebrities who are superficial and show offy, be around people who make you feel bad, and spend your time in toxic physical environments, yet still hope to tap into the wizardry that amplifies your original talents, respects your sterling character, and causes you to release your stardust into society. To increase your inspiration, you need to do the things that increase your inspiration. I know that seems like an obvious insight, yet it is generally observed in the breach. Actively protecting your positivity, so you generate elite creativity and peak productivity just isn't common in a culture that encourages medication by digital distraction and escapism by superficial sensationalism. To have the rewards that only 5% of the population experience, you really do have to hardwire the habits and install ways of being that 95% of the population are unwilling to embrace. My suggestion is that you build a moat around your most hope-filled mindset and a wall around the exuberance of your most exalted aspirations. Allow across the chasm only those influences that fuel your enthusiasm, optimize your inherent genius, maximize your performance, and glorify your native giftedness. Armor plate and battleproof those encouraging thoughts that you work so hard for by setting up an invisible fortress that will not allow entry to anyone or anything that threatens your highness. Because you'll never handcraft your visionary venture and fully express your magic if your tank of inspiration is empty and if you're full of negativity. Oh, and while you're at it, make sure you fill your mind and heart with giant ambition so there is no room for petty worries. Top artists work in positive and beautiful and quiet surroundings for an essential reason, it activates flow state, that stream of brilliance that each of us has available to us, if we structure our workspace and set up our private life in a way that allows us to play at the height of our powers. The painter Andrew Wyeth, on becoming one of the most celebrated artists in history, left New York City and spent the rest of his career working in a studio on a farm in Chadsford, Pennsylvania, and at a seaside cottage in Cushing, Maine. Staying close to the awesome splendor of nature is a habit of all great masters to remain inspired, focused and joyful in an era of tectonic change and immense upheaval. They are also alone a lot, because rising to your greatest creative state only occurs in isolation. J.D. Salinger, after The Catcher in the Rye, became one of the biggest selling books on the planet, retreated from public attention on his 34th birthday, spending his remaining 57 years writing daily in a small studio that was connected to his main house in rural Cornish, New Hampshire, via an underground tunnel. He could go to his writing room without being seen by the photographers and fans waiting outside. James Bond creator Ian Fleming purchased a retreat in Jamaica he named Goldeneye that was perched over a ravishingly lovely beach to provide him with the epiphanies and artistic fuel that would increase his craft. I find it fascinating that he instructed his gardeners not to walk past the window of his writing studio as it would break his artistic trance. As Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Winston Churchill, to get relief from the pressures of being the wartime leader who stood up to the Nazi regime, would spend weekends at Chequers, the official country house of the head of the British government, or at Chartwell, his lakeside residence in southeast England. In these places, he would plan military strategy, carefully write his mesmerizing speeches, paint landscapes and smoke cigars in the verdant gardens. World builders, as well as everyday heroes committed to honoring their promise, all understand the IBA principle. They appreciate that the fortification of positivity, inspiration and high hopes at a time of general negativity is mission central to their campaign of producing sublime work and leading a life that surges with happiness, serenity and spiritual freedom. 14. Stop calling your genius shit. Everywhere you go, you'll hear good people using bad words for great things. The way to enlightenment is to not give a fuck. Wear stylish sneakers, and you'll be applauded for rocking sick kicks. Learn to meditate, visualize, journal and pray to release old trauma, banish timidity and boost your confidence, and your friends will celebrate you for being gangster. Deliver the most spectacular work performance of your lifetime, yet, and you'll be told you killed it. Uplift your craft, so you grow nearer to your potential, and peers will exclaim, you're doing really cool shit. Really? Words mean what words say. 
and the words you use send potent messages to your unconscious mind about who you are, what you can achieve, and the quality of what you will produce. I delivered a leadership keynote at an event attended by the senior management of one of the global behemoths of the media sector a while ago. Two young, and very decent, men drove me, and the teammate who travels with me to the airport. We chatted about fantastic food, interesting music and the importance of following our bliss. I then asked the driver about his ambitions. He revealed a secret desire to move to Canada. He shared that he loved the natural beauty of the nation, the civility of its people and the efficiency of its infrastructure. But I know it's impossible, he repeated, over and over and over, thereby reinforcing the neural circuit associated with impossibility because, as any good neuroscientist will tell you, brain cells that fire together wire together. People really do reveal their deepest beliefs by their daily behaviors. And they're sabotaging wounds via their spoken words. The young man's fears had done a con job on his desires. His disloyal doubts had kidnapped his trustworthy dreams. The false assumptions, fake barriers and then truthful worldview he absorbed from those around him taught him to speak like a powerless victim. To see prison bars that were not there, sort of like when a dog who had an invisible fence around its yard, has that fence taken away, yet still won't cross the border. The young man imagined a blockade, where a doorway actually exists. It isn't what we don't know that gives us trouble, it's what we know that ain't so, said entertainer and humorist Will Rogers astutely. I pay such attention to the words I speak. I don't even call out fall, because the word fall has negative implications in my philosophy. I love autumn. I have no interest in a fall. Those things hurt. Sometimes badly. I remember reading a message from a reader who said he wished he could attend a live event I was leading, but couldn't because I'd have to cross the ocean. Did he think the only way to get there was a month-long sea swim? Did he believe crossing oceans can only be done these days in rickety rowboats? Did he overestimate that making it to the gathering required him to have the audacity of Sir Edmund Hillary? and the leonhardedness of Joan of Arc? The driver's obsession with the word impossible, he seriously just kept repeating that swear word, displayed his rigid and unhealthy mentality. And then, sadly, his restricted psychology became a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we don't think something is possible, then we won't do the work, apply the consistency and exercise the patience needed to make the fantasy real. So it doesn't happen. Which then confirms to us, that it was all impossible. And while I'm on the theme of choosing words carefully as a means to maximize your creativity, productivity, and prosperity, in a billion years I'd never label the work that fuels my spirit, expresses my talent, provides the oxygen of my life, and allows me to serve other human beings shit. I'd never compliment anyone by saying they look sick. I'd never demean someone's hard-earned success by saying their high achievement is crazy. And when someone knocked a performance out of the park, I'd never tell them they murdered it. Because shit and sickness and craziness and murders are bad. Not good. As I see it. Splendid language has charisma to it. So exercise yours well. 15. What J.K. Rowling taught me about relentlessness. The facts, the author of the Harry Potter series has sold more than 500 million books. This literary titan is the first female novelist to become a billionaire. The writer who rose from poverty and obscurity to wealth and fame is now a leading philanthropist. Her father was an aircraft engineer at a Rolls-Royce factory, and her mother worked in the chemistry department at the school Rowling studied at. As a child she lived for books, describing herself as your basic common or garden bookworm complete with freckles and national health spectacles. This luminary wrote her first book at the age of six, and her first novel at the age of eleven, it was about seven cursed diamonds. I only wish I could be so imaginative. The vision for Harry Potter came to J.K. Rowling while she sat on a train that was delayed on its trip from Manchester to King's Cross Station in London. Actually, the ideas for all seven books came to her on that single trip, along with the central theme for the first one, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. In a blazing intuitive hit, the concept showed up for her in a single sentence, boy who doesn't know he's a wizard goes to wizarding school. She wrote longhand on scraps of paper, 
that she eventually carried around with her in a suitcase, yes, a suitcase. Much of the first Harry Potter book was written at Nicholson's Cafe and the Elephant House in Edinburgh, while Rowling was a single mother on welfare. During the writing process, the author's much-loved mother died, pushing her into a long-lasting depression. Rowling continued to create, using the emotional darkness as soil to make her characters richer and more memorable. Difficulty truly can be a trusted companion for creative victory. On completing the book, she sent three chapters to a series of prominent literary agents. Only one replied. Rowling said, it was the best letter I had received in my life. She received numerous rejections from publishers who said the book would not be commercially successful or interesting to young audiences. Bloomsbury finally agreed to publish Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, but asked Joan Rowling, as she was then known, to add a K after her first initial, as they believed a clearly female name would turn off the intended audience of young boys. K stands for Kathleen, her grandmother's first name. Even after she became one of the best-selling authors of all time, she said that she didn't walk around thinking she's fab. Her main goal as an artistic laborer is writing better than yesterday. She published a series of crime books under the pen name Robert Galbraith. Without revealing who she was, she sent the book to publishers for consideration. One of the many rejection letters she received suggested that a writer's group or writing course may help. Remember what I offered to you earlier? Someone's opinion is just someone's opinion. Do not believe it, if it doesn't serve your assent. A Japanese proverb teaches, fall down seven times. Rise up eight. J.K. Rowling lived this wisdom. And this made her great. 16. Guard good health like a pro athlete. Okay. A bit of a longer chapter here, yet I promise it'll be worth the trip. So let's get started. The historian Thomas Fuller once wrote, Health is not valued until sickness comes. Hmm. Deep truth, yes? An audience member approached me after a presentation I'd just delivered in Qatar to the apex of CEOs in the region and handed me a crinkled note, asking me to read it when I had a quiet moment. That evening in my hotel room, I scanned these words scribbled onto the paper, health is the crown on the well person's head that only the ill person can see. Those who don't make time for exercise must eventually make time for illness, Edward Stanley, the British statesman, reminded us. Few habits will transform your performance and escalate your cheerfulness more than optimizing, what I call heals it in the curriculum, that I teach to my advanced mentoring clients in my Ikings program and in my online coaching course The Circle of Legends. So many pundits in the personal development realm speak of mincet and evangelize the mincet as everything mantra. With immense respect for all such educators, I take a contrarian approach to the self-mastery equation. Yes, calibrating your mincet to install the thinking and mental programming of greatness is essential for domain-dominant performance. Your daily behavior surely does reflect your deepest beliefs. And your income and influence never rise any higher than your self-identity and intellectual story. So mince it matters. Absolutely. Yet it's not everything. As human beings we are far more than merely our psychology. We also have a second dimension, that I call Hirtzit, which speaks to the reality that, along with our psychology, each of us also has an emotionality. We not only possess the ability to think, we also carry a precious capacity to feel. It's simply not possible to step into your highest knowledge, experience intimacy with your hidden powers, accomplish spellbinding results and experience sustained gratitude, awe, and wonder if you only live in your head. Yes, calibrate your mincet, but, please, also make the time to purify your hirtzit, so it's free of the suppressed toxic emotions of fear, anger, sadness, disappointment, resentment, shame and guilt that every human being accumulates as we advance through a life and endure misfortunes. Fail to deal with and steadily heal this field of hurt that lurks in your subconscious and you'll find the peak of your energy, creativity, and productivity will always be blocked, this is extremely important to understand. In a coming chapter, I'll walk you through some dynamic methods and transformational tactics to clear out this invisible baggage. For now, 
Simply appreciate that doing the work required to release old emotional wounds is essential to upgrading your performance. Otherwise, your excellent intellectual intentions will always be sabotaged by your secret shadows lodged deep within your heelsit. Working on our mincet yet neglecting our heertsit is also the primary reason most learning, whether through books, digital training or live conferences, doesn't last. We get the information at a cognitive level, but don't integrate it as an emotional knowing in the body. So it doesn't stick. This means our weaker habits and limiting behaviors stay in place, because of our inability to embrace the ideas as a felt truth due to the blockages within our heartsit. All right. So as human beings we have the interior empires of mincet and heartsit. Both need to be attended to and cultivated consistently to enjoy the outer empires of sensational creativity, rare air productivity, unusual prosperity and heavyweight service to society. Yet that's not the end of the personal mastery. Equation. There are two more inner universes in my mentoring curriculum that, when also elevated, complete the algorithm for self-leadership. These are Heelsit and Soulsit. Let's have a look at the visual framework below, the four interior empires. It's only when all four of these human dynasties are awakened, and then improved, that you will reveal your genius, display your highness, lead your field and experience a life of rare air positivity, vitality, wonder and spiritual freedom. The primary reason, and this is very important, that most attempts to know your sovereign self fail, is because this contrarian approach is not considered. And then applied. So after Mincid and Heertzid is interior empire number three. Heertzid is your physicality. You won't change the world if you're sick. Or dead. Optimizing your Heertzid which I'll focus on for most of the rest of this chapter involves improving your energy increasing your immunity and reducing inflammation to be disease, and significantly extend your lifespan. Finally, Solsit speaks to your spirituality, the relationship with that eternal part of you that is flawlessly wise, completely unbreakable, united with every other human on the planet and limitless. Solsit practice is all about reducing the noise of your ego, so you can hear the whispers of the primal hero that is who you truly are, underneath the layers of doubt and disbelief that we all collect as we advance through our years. I need to repeat this, because I want to reinforce this, it is only when you do the daily work to grow each of the four interior empires that you will experience exponential gains in your exterior empires of creativity, productivity, prosperity and public service to many. With this extremely important and rarely discussed context covered, let us now zoom in on the key priority of battleproofing your finest health by optimizing your heelsit. As you raise your physical dimension, you'll build an even better brain, enhance your focus, activate unusual stamina, multiply the amount of willpower at your disposal, uplift your mood, reduce the dangers of chronic inflammation that breeds disease, sleep better and live longer. One of the learning models that my clients have found valuable when it comes to generating their highest heelsit and getting as fit as a professional athlete is the trinity of radiant vitality. The Trinity of Radiant Vitality. The first element of the Trinity of Radiant Vitality, as you can see, encourages you to exercise, ideally, every morning. To play your greatest game you want to be a PMM. A perpetual movement machine, except when it's time to RRR renew, recover and rest. The exercising habit releases the neurochemical dopamine, which will produce strong gains in the inspiration that you feel for the rest of the day. What is this factor alone worth to you in terms of your influence, income, impact and well-being? Sweating just after you wake up by running on a treadmill or skipping rope or spinning on a bike, as just a few examples, will also release BDNF, brain-derived. Neurotropic factor, which promotes neurogenesis, the generation of new brain cells, and repairs brain cells damaged by the previous day's stress. BDNF will also increase the speed at which your brain processes information by increasing the connections among your neural pathways, giving you a massive advantage in the new world we work within. Morning exercise will further produce norepinephrine, which activates peak concentration in this era of overwhelming digital distraction, as well as serotonin, which regulates anxiety, maximizes your memory, and leaves you feeling relaxed. Working out will also raise your metabolic rate, giving you more energy. The simple ritual of moving vigorously in the morning 
will reshape the excellence of your days. Having a strong sweat before the sun rises is one of the core habits that I live by. I really hope that you wire this one in, as it's so completely revolutionary to every other area of your life. I also recommend a late afternoon or early evening routine that I call the Second Wind Workout, 2WW, which ensures that at the end of your workday you schedule a second round of exercise to create even more of the supreme benefits that physical fitness delivers. If you truly agree with me that exercising is a magnificent needle mover when it comes to establishing peerless productivity, heroic output and automatic optimism, why would you only work out once a day? After a day of riding, for example, I love heading to the forest near our home and walking in the woods for an hour. The Japanese are masters of Shinrin-yoku. Shinrin means forest in Japanese and yoku means bath. Forest bathing via a walker mountain bike ride in the woods has many advantages, including the reduction of the stress hormone cortisol, a significant increase in natural killer cells, the body's disease-fighting agents, enhanced cognitive function and greater confidence. On my forest walks or rides during my 2WW, I'll often listen to an audiobook or a podcast to get in another hour or two of learning time. Education is inoculation against irrelevance. So I take growing daily very seriously. To upgrade your heels of I also encourage you to balance cardio activity with weight training to scale your strength and daily stretching to increase your mobility. You never want to allow an old stiff person into your body. As you can see from the main learning model of this chapter, the second element of the trinity of radiant vitality is nutrition. Let food be thy medicine, advised the Greek physician Hippocrates. Your nutritional plan is a primary component of becoming as healthy as a professional athlete and remaining enthusiastic, energetic, jubilant and ultra-effective for a long time. As much as possible, eat real versus processed foods, as the latter are loaded with chemicals and other toxins that will degrade your performance and diminish your longevity. I do my best to eat organic meals and really try hard to support the local farmers of my community. I'm also committed to polishing my cooking skills, so my family and I enjoy healthy and natural food prepared at home, often with wonderful music playing in the background and fascinating conversation flowing between us. I'm not quite sure how many more books I'll write, as part of me has a romantic dream of opening an 11-seat restaurant in a difficult-to-find location where I lovingly prepare each plate from the freshest ingredients available for those intrepid souls who make the trek to come visit me. Maybe we'll have dinner together sometime. I'd love to meet you. Another important element of outstanding nutrition is supplementation. Simply said, much of what your body needs to perform at its summit cannot be gained solely from the food we eat. As a matter of fact, the food we now eat is vastly different and far less nutritious than the same food even a decade ago, given the disrespect we as a species have shown the earth. So you really need to add in the supplements required for you to operate at your best. I also must share that getting my genome analyzed changed my life. My genomicist walked me through which of my genes were suboptimal so that by the power of epigenetics, EP means above, so the study of epigenetics is about rising above your genetics, by modifying your lifestyle habits, I could upregulate genes that would benefit my health most. Taking supplements, installing enhanced daily routines and adopting the new behaviors that will cause dormant genes to turn on, and the less than ideal genes not to express themselves are all examples of using biohacking to actively reorder your genetic destiny. The genes you've inherited from your parents really are not your fate. You have far more power to shape how your genome expresses itself than you may know. Okay. The last two things I wish to mention about nutrition are fasting and hydration. None of what I'm offering you here is medical advice, so kindly discuss any new health regime with your doctor. I will, however, share my personal experience with fasting because the practice has been so incredibly helpful to my productivity as well as to my good health. I generally fast on most weekdays when I'm in a work season where I'm writing a new book or doing speaking tours or shooting online courses. During these times, my last meal is around 9 p.m., and aside from a cup of excellent black coffee, coffee is full of antioxidants and is a tremendous cognitive enhancer, lots of water and fresh mint tea, 
sometimes with organic ginger in it, I won't eat anything until 4 or 5 p.m. the next day. The discipline of fasting has served to keep me deeply focused, highly inspired and full of energy, so I get many important things done. Good research has found that fasting increases the production of BDNF, which, as I've mentioned, boosts brain function. It also reduces neurodegradation and enhances neuroplasticity, which accelerates learning capacity, improves memory, and lowers your blood sugar and insulin levels. In one study, caloric restriction was shown to increase human growth hormone levels by more than 300%. Curbing your caloric intake even just a few times a week has further been found to turn on genes, remember epigenetics? That instructs cells to preserve resources and push your system into a state known as autophagy, where your body goes into hyperdrive to clean out old, damaged cellular material and fix cells injured by stress. I also use the ritual of fasting to help me make progress spiritually. As St. Francis de Sales wrote, besides the ordinary effort of fasting and raising the mind, subduing the flesh, confirming goodness and obtaining a heavenly reward, it is also a great matter to be able to control greediness and to keep the sensual appetites and the whole body subject to the law of the spirit. And although we may be able to do but little, the enemy nevertheless stands more in awe of those whom he knows can fast. Let me ask you with sincere respect, how can we ever hope to master our impulses, produce our masterwork, lead gorgeous lives, and materialize our mighty missions, if we can't even control what we eat? For me, fasting makes me more present, so much more creative, exponentially stronger, far more able to do the difficult things that are closer to my truest spiritual self. Oh I also drink a lot of water through the day, since proper hydration, which improves mitochondrial function, is essential to multiplying your energy. The third and final element of the trinity of radiant vitality is recovery. Rest is the elite producer's secret weapon. Recovery is not a luxury it's a necessity and a priority that is beyond important for sustaining world-class productivity over not just years, but decades. Contrary to the dominant beliefs of our culture, Hours spent renewing your depleted resources is time beautifully invested. Championship athletes all have one practice in common, they sleep a lot. When I write of the rich value of recovery to fireproof your fitness and to protect pristine physicality, I not only refer to a good pre-sleep ritual, great sleep hygiene, naps and regular massage. Recovery can also be active, so long as it's away from work. Real renewal requires large blocks of time away from any influence that causes anxiety. This could include reading, conversations with interesting people, enjoying a great film, going to the gym, traveling and going out for dinner with someone you love. Personally, I also gain enormous refueling through visits to art galleries, my periods in nature, by making sure I'm having fun, and be a morning routine that involves meditation, visualization, auto-suggestion and prayer. One of the most powerful ways to win in business is to outlive your peers so that you have another few decades to master your craft and polish your powers. One of the smartest ways to build your fortune is to extend the lifetime of your earning years so that you have more time to allow the extraordinary phenomenon of compounding to work its magic. And one of the smartest ways to experience a life of sovereignty and genuine happiness is to make sure your life is a very long one. Implementing the trinity of radiant vitality consistently will ensure this result. So you guard your good health like a pro athlete. Happiness is nothing more than good health and a bad memory noted humanitarian and polymath Albert Schweitzer. I do believe he was right. 17. My four chocolate croissant evening. So. I sure don't want you to think that, because I exercise daily, eat cleanly, fast consistently and biohack to leverage the benefit of epigenetics, I never slip. Or treat myself. I do. Because I'm no guru. And very human. 2500 years or so ago, Aristotle articulated the golden mean doctrine, which states that virtuous behavior requires one to walk the middle ground between asceticism and indulgence to take the path of moderation between excess and deprivation. To avoid being an extremist in any dimension of one's life. Here's a maxim that's worth remembering. Restriction promotes addiction. Which brings me to a confession. 
The other evening, after many months working on this book for you, rising before the sun most days, to set myself up for prodigiously productive work sessions and fasting for extended hours, so my thinking was clear, and my energy was concentrated on this project, I decided to reward myself for my dedication. And give myself the comfort that I was vigorously craving. So I ordered delivery of some freshly made Italian pasta. I then used it to make one of my favorite dishes, bucatini al lemon. The ingredients are the pasta, extra virgin olive oil, pecorino cheese, some black pepper, lemon zest and lemon juice and a little mint to provide a hint of sweetness and a bit of good color on the presentation. Here's what the plate looked like, bucatini al lemon made by me with love. How delicious it was. It soothed my stomach and serenaded my soul. When no one was looking, I even sang the bucatini a sweet little love song. Yes, I was that enamored with the pasta. And, in that lofty state of carbohydrate bliss, I just had to keep going next. I ordered a pizza with three types of cheese and a very thick crust, the size of Mount Kilimanjaro, it seemed. And finally, I collected four, yes, four, splendid and divine and lavish and ethereal and marvelous, and heavenly butter made fresh out of the oven Italian croissants with chocolate, inside them called Sacatini al Ciocolato, not that I was enthusiastic about them or anything. And when no one on the street seemed to be looking, I ate each one. While I was walking. With a smile the width of a stadium pinned across my face. Did I mention I'm not a guru? And that I'm very human? I do have a point to this vulnerable oversharing. Everything in moderation including moderation is a sensible way to play. Thanks for the tip, Oscar Wilde. He is also reported to have said, I can resist everything except temptation. All I'm saying is this, in a civilization that makes us feel guilty, damaged and demeaned, unless we are perfect, successful and running 83 advanced performance practices a day, with checklists to record our execution around each one, maybe, just maybe, we should make peace with balance. And be okay with Aristotle's middle way, embracing the pleasures of this special world, when it's the right time to love them. Life's just too short to be all rigid and machine-like, right? Makes me think of the marathoners who have dropped. Dead of a heart attack, as well as the non-nas who had two shots of grappa each night, and lived well past 100. I sometimes wonder, if the positive neurochemistry that's generated by doing things that make you happy, like a cheat meal, is a far better pursuit than the superhuman strictness and uberperson uptightness that likely produces more cortisol, which corrodes our vitality along with our longevity. I overdid it because I had pushed myself too hard. A little less restriction and a bit more indulgence in those intense months on this project would have led to me enjoying a small plate of pasta perhaps a slice or two of pizza, and maybe three fewer chocolate croissants. On that warm summer's evening. 18. A contrarian philosophy for mastering unexpected change. For more than 20 years, I've walked in the same forest. During the positive periods of my journey, these woods have provided me with a place to regenerate my creativity, refuel my energy and restore my tranquility. In those stages where I've suffered from difficulty, navigated tragedy and experienced groundlessness, this forest became a monastery of sorts a retreat for my growth and steady transformation. Along one of the trails, by a small pond favored by lively ducks, sits a sign bearing words that have helped me enormously to navigate uncertainty. Here's what the important part says, forests renew themselves through natural disturbances such as wind, fire, insects and disease. These disturbances result in the creation of areas of dead trees within which a new forest will grow. You see, the nature of nature is unyielding change. And sometimes the foundations we stand on must fall, so that they may be replaced with even stronger ones. Breakthroughs require breakdowns. Progress cannot happen without upheaval and the birth of something better always demands a death of something familiar. Uncomfortable disturbance is essential, not only for your evolution, but for your very survival. Just like within my forest. The sign of my forest monastery. To the untrained eye, turbulence is judged as bad and labeled as wrong. We wish things would go back to the way they were. So we would feel safer. Yet the discomfort of growth is always better than the illusion of safety. 
Seriously. Standing still is an immensely harmful act for anyone dedicated to becoming an everyday hero. Your advancement as a leader and your optimization as a person are built around the doing of difficult things. What is easiest to do is generally what is least valuable to do. Lasting transformation happens during our stormy seasons, never during the days of our ease. The great saints, sages and spiritual geniuses all understood that a main aim on the path to awakening was to stand in any mess that life sends and remain contented, courageous, serene and free. To stay tranquil while all appears to be falling apart. To construct an inner axis of power so strong and yet so flexible that nothing on the outside could shake its roots. Imagine this, making an interior life that stays graceful, quiet and grateful, regardless of what is happening outside of you. To have your strength depend not on worldly stability, but upon your primal heroism. As you release resistance to change in your personal life or professional career or external environment and embrace the new circumstances that destiny has sent, you will come to see any volatility that is unfolded as a grand blessing. A necessary note in the soaring symphony that is the master plan of the world. And a carefully crafted stepping stone into the growth and evolution that will make you into the leader, producer, warrior and loving citizen that true victory pleads with you to become. What the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the master calls a butterfly, the aviator and author Richard Bach once wrote. Or as the eminent philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche observed, one must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. 19. You're absolutely more than enough. Eleanor Roosevelt said, comparison is the thief of joy. And we sure do live in the culture of comparison, don't we? We feel happy about a work win until someone on the team gets what we perceive to be more recognition than we received. We are content with our romantic partner until we see someone who looks better on the arm of another. We feel financially secure until we see a photo of someone sunbathing on their yacht, flying private whenever they wish, and sniffing the roses in the colorful gardens that surround their opulent mansion. We feel confident about how we look until we spot an image of another with a leaner physique and a more model-esque face. Much of my own emotional healing has centered around learning to feel good enough. Learning to be content with who I am, the way I live, and whatever I have and not comparing my life to the lives of others, which, I've discovered, often turn out to be nothing more than carefully crafted illusions designed to sell a brand and push a product. I've also learned that there are no extra people on this planet. Each of us has value. Everyone matters. And the cash in someone's bank account or the size of someone's home doesn't mean they are in any way better than you or more important to the world than you. Why does our spiritually damaged society prescribe that a tycoon is more valuable than a ditch digger? Or that a state leader should be considered more powerful than a teacher? Or an emergency worker? Or a sandwich maker? I really don't get this. And it bothers me. Money is only one metric of success. It's only one form of wealth. There are many more, you know? Like being a good person and doing work that satisfies you, like having a fulfilling family life, and being around friends who flood you with gratitude and hope. Many obsess over financial return on investment yet, tragically, ignore the value of character Roy and happiness Roy and spiritual Roy. And I must tell you, from my experience as the advisor to a ton of captains of industry, billionaires and entertainment titans, that a lot of them have all the assets you could imagine, yet are troubled, unhappy and fraught with worry. Too much money can become a formula for complexity, difficulty and often outright misery. Personally, I place a vastly higher value on inner freedom than upon financial gain. Consider the richness of a person who is always on time, has wonderful manners, is consistently considerate of the needs of others and cares about the environment. Takes immense pride in doing their simple work with eagerness, high ethics and uncommon excellence radiates positivity even in harsh conditions, sees the best in all around them, and exemplifies thankfulness for whatever they have. Isn't one such as this a hero of our society? A model of mastery? A representative of the extraordinary? Own your specialness. Celebrate your virtues. Appreciate your goodness. Salute all you've gone through as well as the brilliant blessings that your future has in store for you. 
do not minimize your majesty understand once and for all that there's no one exactly like you alive on the planet today no one since the beginning of the human empire only one of you has been made amazing yes just one of you with your fingerprints your gifts your authentic ambitions your way of talking working walking and loving good god you're amazing yes the media you consume might send you photos of people who appear to have thinner tummies and videos of actors driving spectacular sports cars. But that doesn't mean you're not startlingly worthy. Because you are. Absolutely one of a kind. And while I believe it's very important to keep making every aspect of your life better, every single day, please also know and trust that who you are right now is more than enough. So may I humbly suggest that you give yourself the words, praise and encouragement you are waiting for forces outside of you to give. And become your own top cheerleader, your single finest supporter and your number one fan. 20. The Starter's Activation Declaration. I've compassed a statement for you to recite early in the morning while your neighborhood is silent, so you can access your brightest fire and most astonishing talents at the quietest time of the day. While the rest of the world is asleep, you have the opportunity to achieve a primary triumph, to associate with your purest self, to cultivate your dormant strength, and to remember what you seek to stand for over the hours ahead. At sunrise, when all is still, before the noise of the day has begun, you can access that side of yourself that has remained unwounded by discouragements of the past, that refuses to be conquered by negativity and defeat, and that wishes to exist in a way that makes a difference. Reading this declaration aloud at dawn will, over time, reprogram both your conscious and subconscious mind to shed the false beliefs that have kept you small and scared. It will load in the thoughts and feelings that forge everyday heroism and re-engineer the way you get things done. Here you go, this day is a blessing that I will honor, savor and make fullest use of. Tomorrow is an idea. Today is what's real. And so I choose to live it elegantly, patiently, and immaculately. Over the moments coming, I will show up as a leader, not as a victim. As an originator, not a copier. As a visionary, instead of a follower. Today, I choose to be extraordinary rather than average. And brave, instead of timid. A hero in my own distinct way, instead of giving away my potent powers by blame, complaint and excuse. Insecurity and meekness and the fear of rejection will not pollute my productivity, nor hinder my ability to uplift, respect and render value to other people. This day, I will make time for reflection and deep thinking, resist all time wasters, remain in the present moment and perform labor that reveals mastery, while remaining true to my highest ideals. Today, I will keep each promise I make to myself, defend my hopefulness, exercise my best habits, and accomplish the things that make my heart sing. For I have much music in me. And I will no longer disrespect myself by keeping that song within. In the hours ahead, I will be supremely disciplined and incredibly focused, never confusing being busy with getting major feats done. And should I need to rest, I will not measure this as a waste, understanding that first-class performance without honest recovery leads to the degradation of my native genius. Today, I will not leave the sight of a great insight without taking some action to implement it. I know that ideation without execution is the sport of fools. And that making amazing dreams real is an enormous act of self-love. This day, I will be more valiant than yesterday, more optimistic than I was last evening, and kinder than I was last night. I understand that big people are the ones who make others feel bigger. And that on my deathbed, what will matter most will be the human beings I've inspired, the caring I've delivered and the generosity I've displayed. And so in the face of any chattering doubts, I will advance my most sensational projects and produce towering work that stands the test of time. Because I know that frustration is the child of stagnation. And steady progress is a testimony to my talent. Regardless of old challenges, I will take my next step into the ring. In spite of any self-doubt, I will continue the climb to my most aspirational summits. I am more of a doer than a talker, more of a deliverer. Than a dabbler, more of a pro than an amateur. 
I know that monuments are made one stone at a time. And so I start. And stay concentrated, grounded and centered. For many hours at a time, without being distracted by nuisances. And in so doing no matter what the outcome I've realized a central victory. Over my darker self. And the weakness that once bound me. And as I continue to make my small advances toward my highest ideals, my tiny triumphs introduce me to the truth and strongness within me. And this reconnection electrifies the once damaged relationship with my most glorious self. 21. The very good bearded man in the really cool baseball cap. I'm in Rome as I write you this chapter. Soon I'll leave to give a speech to business leaders in Sweden. Two days ago. I delivered a leadership presentation to 400 senior executives in Dubai. I know it might not seem like it, but I've chosen to speak at fewer conferences these days. I'm in a season of my life where I wish to travel less, improve my cooking skills more, and live more of a writer's life. So I'm enjoying my time on stages immensely. Yesterday, I was at Dubai's humongous airport and happened to be in an elevator with a man who wore a cap I thought was neat. As a kid, I rode motocross bikes, and the logo on his hat was of a brand that was cool. I hesitated in giving him the compliment I wanted to give, scared of rejection. Oh, the joys we miss, and the marvels we lose stuck in the fear of being unwelcomed by others. I'll tell you a story about my brush with Hollywood royalty and my lost opportunity, in an upcoming chapter. Then I realized, that I might not get the chance, to appreciate this gentleman's baseball cap again. And so I did, what I really wanted to do. So what if I looked silly? Life's greatest risk is taking no risks, right? Love your hat, I declared, unsure of the response I'd receive. Amazingly, without any hesitation whatsoever, he removed the cap from his head and said, please take it. In the past I would have refused the gift, out of politeness, and some insecurity around deserving the gesture. This time I got it right. I do get things right once in a while. I acknowledged his unusual kindness with my sincere acceptance. He smiled. A very generous smile. Quite lovely to witness, actually. As we left the elevator, I asked him to wait for a moment. I opened my carry-on case and plucked out a fresh copy of the 5 a.m. club. I often bring a few copies of this book that has transformed so many lives on the road to give to flight attendants who over-deliver hotel room service attendants who really care, and taxi drivers who share a good story. The book was clearly destined for him. I wrote his name, Muhammad, onto it with an inscription of good wishes to him, and gently handed it over. He beamed. Magnificently. With my wonderful new friend at DXB, yes, that's his once beloved hat gracing my once hair covered head, I included that picture, just to share the magic of what happened between two strangers on that Sunday afternoon in a crowded airport. You know, there's a ton of negativity and toxicity and outright tragedy unfolding in the world right now. It hurts my heart to see the injustice, meanness, rudeness, greediness and hatred in evidence on the planet. And yet I am also really clear that I've never seen so much decency being displayed by so many everyday heroes. I'm consistently moved to tears by the goodness demonstrated by so many diverse human beings across so many different nations. I'm viscerally inspired by the random acts of nobility I've seen being performed by so many wise souls, even when they have little to gain for themselves. This gentleman demonstrated powerfully what it means to be benevolent, to show goodwill to a stranger, to be friendly, kind and selfless. Etienne de Grelet, a Quaker missionary, wrote of our duty, to be considerate to others in the following terms, I shall pass through this world but once. If, therefore, there be any kindness I can show, or any good thing I can do, let me do it now, let me not defer or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. It's so easy for us to profess to stand for the virtues of generosity and kindredness. Yet what makes leadership over one's life real is the doing, of what we believe to be right, this is the highest act of heroism. I still wear that cap from time to time. To remind me of the man I wish to be. And to remember my bearded friend. At the Dubai airport. 22. Train with stronger teachers. I do spin classes with a very fit instructor. She rides hard, 
moves fast and pushes all of us in the class to bring on our best. When I first started taking her early morning classes a few years ago, I couldn't keep up. I wondered if this was the right sport for me and felt like quitting. I couldn't cycle to the rhythm and was unable to stick with the beat. You'd feel embarrassed just watching my awkward struggle, trust me. I looked out of place in a class full of what seemed to be superb athletes and bumbled through the choreographed moves the polite yet tough instructor asked us to follow. Yet everything that you now find easy you once found hard, right? And consistency is the mother of mastery, correct? And persistency breeds the longevity demanded to become legendary. And so, I swallowed my pride, strapped on those biking shoes and kept on riding, session after sweaty. Session, in the face of intense embarrassment, immense exhaustion and obvious mediocrity. Yet as I continued, something unexpectedly wonderful and uncommonly inspirational, and maybe even genuinely beautiful, at least to my tired eyes, began to happen. The classes with this very strong instructor started to feel a little more comfortable. The game crash I'd feel at 5 p.m. on the days I'd spin wasn't as exhausting. I became less goofy on the bike, more fluid in the class and a whole lot braver in that dark, candle-filled room. As the weeks and months advanced, I cycled faster. I began to ride on beat. And I started to have fun. Serious fun. All I'm trying to offer you in sharing this private scenario is this. We rise most not when we try to build Rome in a day, but when we steadily make the mini victories that call on us to remember our lost powers and reclaim our sleeping strengths. Small, consistent and regular always beats all fire and bravado at the beginning, with a gigantic flame out at the end. Please also know that growth you make in one area brings growth in every other area of your life. Because the way you do one thing sets up the way you'll do everything. And remember, as well, that remarkable blessings always come to those who show exceptional loyalty to the promises they make to themselves. The story gets better. On the sunny Saturday morning, that I write this passage for you, while here in Tribeca in the quietude of a hotel room for 13 days of writing, far from the demands, complexities, and distractions that often invade my life, I went to a spin class run by the same gym that I go to at home. I wasn't quite sure if I could keep up with a lithe, chiseled and fit instructor who looked like a pop star, or with the people in the room who looked like reigning fitness champions. I felt nervous, unsure and insecure. Like I did when I first experienced the sport. Then the music started. The teacher pedaled. The candles flickered. And I pushed into gear. As the class progressed, I began to ride hard, grew stronger as the minutes passed, and felt happier as each song played. I danced on the bike earlier this morning, felt my soul soar, and made my body sweat, as never before. Thanks to all the training with my super strong hometown instructor, the class turned out to be a piece of cake. Delightful and enjoyable and fairly effortless, truth be told. We humans are astounding creatures. Totally designed to adapt, flourish and advance. Do you, I and all our brothers and sisters alive today bear a natural capacity to try something new, stay with the process, transcend the challenges and draw closer to mastery. This journey is how we gain precious glimpses of what we truly are. This is how we play with the gods of our incremental growth and dance with the angels of our greatest selves. We must always walk toward the pursuits that frighten us. For there our gifts live. Let me ask you something, when was the last time you tried something for the first time? And if that time was a long time ago, what are you waiting for? Who you were, even yesterday, need not limit all you can achieve today. So try something new. That pushes you to grow. With a really great instructor showing you the way. 23. A red flag is a red flag. For my son's 25th birthday we planned a long weekend in Los Angeles a city I love very much. We'd go watch the Dodgers play. I don't really like baseball, but my son does, and I really do love my son. We'd go for great sushi. We'd walk the pier in Santa Monica. We'd get our fortunes told at Venice Beach. I'd been in law for a few days before he landed, as I had some media appearances to make and some business meetings to attend. Shortly after he arrived at the hotel, we headed to a renowned, yet simple Italian restaurant. Great vibe. Nice people. 
Good queso y pepe. Before our main course arrived, two well-dressed men entered the trattoria and sat right next to us. I said hello, and we all began talking about current events, our favorite cities and observations we've made around the way the world is unfolding. At one point, as the conversation turned to relationships, one of our new friends said something superbly insightful that I believe is worth sharing with you. A red flag is a red flag. Hmm. It took me well over 50 years to learn that one. The hard way. When someone shows you who they are, believe them, said the celebrated poet Maya Angelou. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, goes the wise saying. Look, you and I are both good, trusting, decent and considerate people. And because we are good, trusting, decent and considerate people, we think that everyone we deal with in business and within our personal lives will operate in the same way. But that's just not true. A major pitfall of human perception is thinking that the way you see the world is the way everyone sees the world. And you can get into a whole lot of trouble that might take you years to get out of if you fall into the trap of viewing someone the way you want them to be versus being brutally honest with yourself and seeing them as they are. Self-deception can cost you a fortune. Lying to yourself because you want to believe you found the person you've always wanted as an employee, friend or lover can rip out your heart, terrorize your happiness and destroy your peace of mind, the costliest expense of all. Forever. If you're not careful. Look, I'm an eternal hopifulist. By natural default, I just look for the greatest in people. German poet Johann von Goethe wrote, treat people as if they were what they ought to be, and you help them become what they are capable of being. I've done my best to stay true to his words for many, many years. People do rise to meet your expectations of them. Often. Yet not always. Some people among us are very badly damaged. They have, generally through no fault of their own, been traumatized by harsh events, scarred from terrible tragedies and enormously injured by unexpected treacheries. They deserve our understanding, our empathy and our good wishes. Yet this doesn't mean it's in your enlightened self-interest to make them your business partner, or your buddy or your spouse. Because people who are hurting badly commonly hurt people badly. And those in severe pain, can cause you severe pain. Such people are pretty much guaranteed to devastate your creativity, suck your productivity, and drain you of your energy. Because they can't stop being themselves. For you to wish that the red flags were green lights is just wishful thinking and foolishness. Sure, you can keep seeing their best and loving them. Just do it from afar. Enduringly successful human beings trade in the truth. Even when it disappoints them. 24. The shortest chapter in the history of creativity? How long does a masterwork take? The apprentice asked the master. As long as it takes was the master's simple reply. And don't stop until it's magic. Otherwise you might as well not even start it. Handcrafting your tour de force is far from easy. It will call on you to develop extreme patience with the process, dig deep, pull out your greatness, and come face to face with your dragons. Yet if you continue to completion, you'll become a totally new person. And the confidence, expertise and self-respect gained in making the project will last an entire lifetime. 25. The Rule Bender's Hypothesis. Worrying too much about logistics keeps you stuck in logic a place of great restriction, rather than the limitlessness of your unbridled genius. All masterwork is created in a state of wild abandon, not cold reason. Focus on the what and the how will reveal itself. Obsessing over perfection can be a major enemy of creativity. And a route to never offering any astoundingly good work to humanity. Caring too much about what people think about your visionary venture, the one that is flooding you with energy, is an excellent way to ensure you do nothing that matters. What I'm really suggesting to you is that artistry, ingenuity and your promise require that you step into your renegade nature, launching a rebellion against your intellectual loyalties. Your personal highness calls on you to activate the eccentric within while you raise your freak flag on the pirate boat that you're meant to captain into the uncharted oceans of your potential. Become a revolutionary. Launch your campaign against all that is normal and boring and unfascinating. 
initiate your invasion into the foreign recesses within your creative crevices that the pressures and silly diversions of daily life have placed in lockdown. Bend the rules that the conventions of your craft taught you were the only path to eminence. Split from the crowd. Stray from the herd. Your reputation as a change leader, your destiny as a movement maker, and the joy and ethical power that you seek depend on this. Be not average. Ever. When you produce work that makes your soul sing, you'll make our tired world come a little more alive. You'll make it more lovely. And spiritually sensible. Of course, when you show up like this, you will be misunderstood, unappreciated, criticized and perhaps even reviled for your blatant display of authentic brilliance. When this happens, remember these words of Winston Churchill, you will never reach your destination, if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. When I think of creative superstars, the names of Copernicus, William Shakespeare, Coco Chanel, Walt Disney, Hedy Lammer, Felipe Stark, Jean-Michel Basquiat and Salvador Dali appear in my mind. Inside one of Dali's workrooms. When I consider dazzlingly inventive luminaries and industry disruptors, I remember that Miles Davis copied his heroes, Charlie Parker and Duke Ellington, until he developed the chops, and, even more essentially, the confidence, to run his own race, and create his own original style as a trumpet player. The Alexander McQueen Fashion Show, where supermodel Shalom Harlow walked down the runway until, at the middle, she was sprayed by a series of paint machines that created a mesmerizing design on her dress. The audience roared thunderous applause. The dress is now legendary. Johannes Gutenberg's printing press, which radically transformed the world, allowing for the spread of ideas through books. Before this, generating a mass number of publications for many people to read was widely considered to be impossible. The physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living, that unforgettable magnum opus of English artist Damien Hirst, which shows a violent tiger shark that was killed and then suspended in a tank of formaldehyde. The creature was caught off the coast of Queensland, Australia, by a fisherman who was paid to do so. His only instructions were to catch a shark big enough to eat you. All true artistry, inspired work that challenges assumptions, pushes possibilities and gives you and me the permission to become the creative outlaws we secretly long to be, starts with a pioneering perception of reality. My strongly held belief is this, exponential creativity demands abnormality and requires us to deviate from ordinary company. To materialize your primal genius, you absolutely need to see the opportunities that exist on the other side of the shackles of normal. To dominate your domain and create work that borders on incendiary, you really must commit to respecting your strangeness and steadfastly taking down the traditions that your teachers have taught you are essential to follow for winning. To reveal your imaginative nobility and perform at the razor's edge of your talent, it becomes a necessity to be an activist against the status quo, operate within another orbit of inventiveness, and bend the rules that existed before you entered the field to your own mystifying, mysterious and miraculous vision of a vastly more interesting tomorrow. Makes me think of the words I read after I visited Dolly's bizarre house in the small fishing village of Cadax while on a speaking tour in Spain. I do not understand why, when I ask for grilled lobster in a restaurant, I'm never served a cooked telephone. Exactly. The great maestro's paintbrushes. 26. Have bravery like Swifty. Without a high grade of self-confidence, you'll never have the resolve to translate your silent fantasies into everyday reality. Or the valor required to stay with your most exalted enthusiasms when the going gets messy. And trust me, it will. Makes me think of Erwin Swifty Laser, the iconic Hollywood super agent. When he was just starting out, he was having dinner with a starlet he was hoping to represent. He met the renowned singer Frank Sinatra while in the restroom and excitedly shared that he was a big fan. The crooner, then at the height of his fame, tried to brush Swifty off. But the young man had chutzpah, which is a Yiddish word for supreme nerve and audacious courage. He persisted in chatting with Sinatra with the intent of really connecting. Eventually, Sinatra lowered his guard and warmed to the new agent. Would you please come to our table and say hello to us? asked Swifty politely. I can't. 
I want to be with my party, said Sinatra. I sure would appreciate it, Mr. Sinatra, Swifty pressed. It would mean so very much to me. And you'll enjoy meeting my dinner companion. There was a lengthy pause, and then Sinatra said, okay. Give me 30 minutes. Sure enough, about 30 minutes later, in full public view, the illustrious Frank Sinatra walked past the candlelit tables loaded with celebrities, political leaders and business moguls, straight to where Swifty Laser was seated. He tapped his new acquaintance on the shoulder and with a broad smile said loudly, Hi Swifty. The young man looked up and instantly replied, Not now, Frank. Duly impressed, the starlet signed with the agent that very night. And Swifty Laser went down in history. For his bravery. 27. A teacher called trauma. Suffering is a school. And trauma is a teacher. The dominant message we receive from those who show us how the world works is that trauma is the realm of the broken, damaged and defeated. They say that it only relates to those who have lived in a war zone or experienced a random act of violence, or for those who have been sexually abused, beaten up as a kid, or suddenly lost someone they loved. Not true. And no human is broken, we're all just wounded, to various degrees. Part of what I need to share with you as I write this important chapter for you is this everyone experiences trauma. The fact that you're alive means you've gathered trauma, because it's an inevitable result of the journey that we all take as we move from birth to death. Yes, some of us get hit by life's curveballs harder than others. And so have experienced the tragic events I've listed above. These people have endured what I call in my mentoring methodology macro trauma. It's serious. It cuts deep. And it's hard to shake off. And some other equally good souls among us get off a little easier, facing micro traumas, such as being yelled at by an angry motorist, or having a fight with a spouse, or losing a business deal to an undeserving competitor. But the fact remains that no one gets out alive. Thank you, Jim Morrison. Okay. Let's go even deeper. Trauma is not a dirty word, best to be avoided at stylish cocktail parties and amid polite conversation. No. Not at all. Trauma has been my greatest teacher. It has blessed me with the ability to navigate adversity elegantly, help me to access forgotten creativity that has infused my craft, moved me to become more relatable and humble, and torn down the shield that once protected my tender heart. I wouldn't be the creator, father, partner, brother, and son that I now am without the benefit of the hard times that fortune has thoughtfully placed on my path. And I promise you that, if you exploit your accumulated trauma for your artistic advancement, emotional growth and spiritual liberty, it'll be your greatest academy. Trauma truly happens in your favor, never for your failure. Learning how to do the healing work to unfreeze repressed feelings and process through the stored pain of your ancient wounds will absolutely unleash your most special powers, grandest gifts and wisest self. This profound practice to purify your hirtsit is also a sovereign act of self-love. Because you're making yourself into a healthier, happier, and freer human. Unlocking and displacing past trauma isn't a pastime for the weak. It sure isn't flaky, irrelevant and a waste of time. Actually, it's the pursuit of wise warriors and genuine world builders. Doing this healing is the finest way to ensure the rest of your life is successful and joyful and peaceful. Dealing with your buried hurts and dissolving your suppressed emotions is so very practical and spectacularly relevant to a world-class life that soars, serves and knows its highest strength. This is the work that will magnify your prosperity, maximize performance and amplify your optimism. It really will, even if it seems like it won't. Deep emotional clearing practice will make you far more creative, because trauma deforms the brain and working through your ancient wounding optimizes your cognition. Interesting, right? The stress of difficult events pushed down into your subconscious causes major perceptive blocks, stunts the full release of neurotransmitters, such as dopamine and serotonin, that are essential to peak artistry and actually reduces the ideal connection between the right and left hemispheres of your brain. Release the past pain, anger, sadness, guilt, shame, and regret that you've been carrying like an albatross around your neck, and you'll begin to awaken the possibility that was previously hidden from your view. 
Hirtzid healing will also guarantee that you unleash your fullest vitality. Holding on to trauma consumes a great deal of energy and natural inspiration. One of the results of ignoring what I call accumulated scarring is that you pretty much live in a state of limbic hijack when the survival brain of the limbic system monopolizes your thinking and puts you into fight, flight or freeze mode. You lose the ability to rationally manage any threat, real or perceived, as your prefrontal cortex, the seat of higher thinking, is taken over by the amygdala, the less evolved and more primitive part of your brain. Stress hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol are released, and emotions such as fear, anxiety and anger are ignited. Know that the more severe the wounding of the past, the more intense will be the present-day response when an old wound is activated. You can always tell the size of your trauma or someone else's by the degree of the overreaction. If it's hysterical, it's historical. The spouse who rages over spilled milk has regressed to an earlier age and is living out the smothered pain of the past. The boss who abuses employees and sabotages business associates is simply revealing the weight of their own baggage. The motorist who stops their car and threatens a fistfight because they think you cut them off as being driven by the field of hurt I mentioned earlier, made up of all the invisible collected trauma they allowed to remain at their core. I once sat next to a senior executive on an airplane who asked me to move from my assigned seat because he said he preferred it. When I said I'd like to stay where I was, he began kicking my briefcase and promised he'd take care of me when we landed. Such is the result of failing to work through and let go of emotional injury. Healing your hearts at wounds will ensure that you no longer lash out at people who did not mistreat you and bleed on people who did not cut you. Working through your micro trauma and any macro trauma will also increase the quality of your health beautifully. Trauma and the daily stress response it hardwires into your system make crisis oriented living your default, which in turn reduces your immunity and increases inflammation, making you more susceptible to life threatening conditions such as diabetes, heart attack, stroke, and cancer. Process through your emotional pain, and you restructure the architecture of your hearts it too. Produce less toxicity and more of the wonderful neurochemistry that will improve your physicality and extend your longevity. As you optimize your emotional life, you'll see a clear elevation of your happiness, gratefulness, and capacity to feel versus intellectualize the miracles of life. Trauma causes a human being to disassociate from their body and run their days as an intellectual machine. Before I started doing this healing work myself, I think about the spectacle of a sunrise and reason about the gorgeousness of a piece of art, rather than feel it and inhabit it. Re-engaging your hearts and reactivating your feelings, I promise you, is a completely different way of existing. You begin to use your mind for those pursuits that the mind is good for. And you open your heart and fully experience the pleasure of everything else in your life. What I'm really suggesting is that frozen trauma causes a human being to shut down intimacy with their emotional aliveness and retreat inside their head. This is done out of protection. We flee from our feelings as a trauma response because we don't wish to relive old pain when it is freshly triggered by a current event. So we set up a series of escapes and detours designed to avoid our emotions, such as overwork or drugs or too much alcohol or online addictions and social media distractions. We begin to live our lives as attention seekers versus magic workers. And we wonder why we never feel the intense happiness we hear as part of the human path. Many people, on encountering difficulty or tragedy, end up with PTS, post-traumatic stress. Yet if we exercise our wisdom and make difficult choices, each of us has the ability to exploit setbacks for the benefit of personal transformation. Struggle can actually be used for PTG. Post-traumatic growth. Just look at the greatest men and women of the world. The Nelson Mandela's and the Mother Teresa's and the Mahatma Gandhi's and the MLK's. Each of these advanced souls had one thing in common, they suffered far more than what is ordinary, but rather than allowing the hardship to tear them apart, they leveraged it to remake them. To build them up. To remember their highest moral virtue and their greatest spiritual merits to convert devastating pain into unusual power. I'll walk you through tactics and tools to free trapped emotions so you can liberate your greatness and activate the unlimited genius of your heart 
in an upcoming chapter. For now, simply remember that trauma, wisely used, can become the doorway into your most authentic, creative, and heroic self. So see it as a teacher. Please. 28. The People Builder's Mantra. A true story. There was once a cafe that had a very good manager running the shop. She really cared about her customers. She greeted everyone she met with cheerfulness and politeness. She ensured that the goods on offer were the best in the community, always priced fairly, and that her employees were consistently friendly. The manager's favorite customer was a woman who had been a schoolteacher. In her 80s, she always showed up at the cafe perfectly attired and looking exceedingly graceful. Each morning she visited the cafe, holding the hand of an elderly gentleman, her husband, whom she appeared to love very, very much. Together they would carefully move through the coffee shop and make their way to the counter, always ordering the same thing, two cups of coffee and one small pastry, with two forks, so they could share it. Then they would travel to their usual table and have a conversation. Because business is a conversation. Lose the conversation with your teammates, customers and suppliers and you'll lose your business. A splendid home life is a conversation. Neglect this because you're constantly playing with your devices or watching too much television or working all the time, and you'll likely lose your family. And being an everyday hero begins with having a conversation with yourself about who you wish to be and what you promise to do for the world. Lose the conversation with your finest you and you'll lose the intimacy with your authenticity. So back to the coffee shop. One day it occurred to the manager that her favorite client was no longer showing up at the cafe. She grew quite worried. Because she really cared. A few weeks later she saw the lady standing in line at a bank. But the woman no longer looked impeccably dressed or remarkably relaxed. No. Instead, she now appeared disheveled and confused, and frightened. What's wrong? asked the manager. It's my husband. He suffered a massive stroke a few weeks ago. He died. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know if I can make it. The manager paused, and then spoke in a low, gentle voice. Why don't you come back to the cafe and have a good cup of coffee? I know it'll make you feel better. But who would I drink it with, asked the woman, with a tremor in her voice. I'll drink it with you, said the manager. It would be my pleasure. So the two human beings, in a world in glaring need of greater humanity, walked back to the coffee shop, where the customer ordered her usual, two cups of coffee, one pastry and two forks. And those two people had a conversation. Maya Angelou once wrote this piece of wisdom, people may forget what you say, and people may forget what you do but no one will ever forget how you made them feel. So build people up. Never tear others down. Help anyone in need. If you don't have something good to say to someone, don't say it. Treat all with courtesy and kindness. I know that seems old school, but that was such a good school in so many ways. Leaving everyone you meet better than you found them and feeling bigger than when they first met you is just a fantastic way to roll and a good mantra to be guided by. 29. The 7 Threats to World Class. I'm about to walk you through the 7 primary vulnerabilities that cause potentially legendary creators, leaders, entrepreneurs, athletes and movement makers not to realize their promise. This is one of the most valuable chapters in this book. The starting point is the following maxim, the real aim of mastery is not reaching legendary but sustaining legendary. The main goal of a genuine everyday hero isn't just to create the conditions that take them to their loftiest aspirations. It's to maintain and, of course, improve that ideal state as the remainder of your days unfold. Fantastic if you do what it takes to arrive at world class. The major focus, however, needs to be on remaining there. What makes an icon is the symmetry of optimized mastery and ironclad longevity. Few elements make you more undefeatable and of use to many than staying at the top of your field longer than any of your peers. So how can you insulate the preeminence you generate so that it endures? Simple. Become acutely aware of the seven threats to world class. And with this new awareness of the pitfalls you'll face, you can actively choose to fortify yourself against them. Have a look at this learning framework, the seven threats to world class. 
Based on more than a quarter of a century helping many of the world's top entrepreneurs, financiers, professional athletes and film stars, not only rise to best of breed, but also keep their position at the top, I've deconstructed the dangers you'll face on your ascent to domain dominance into the following seven threats. Threat 1. The threat of talent erosion. Oh my, this one is such a destroyer of outright genius. Just think of the musical giant who is a number one worldwide blockbuster, or the actor who wins an Oscar. Amazing that they accomplish this. But what mostly happens, even though they reach this pinnacle, is that the skills that got them there begin to atrophy. The intensity of performance and output the getting to best in world required leaves them exhausted. All the limelight, applause and adulation leaves them depleted and often craving to get away from it all. Many superstars vanish from public view, sometimes for years, at the height of their powers. They stop caring about upgrading their craft. They no longer put in the daily practice time. They lose the fire to keep playing out on the jagged edges of their most luminous gifts and taking their craft into uncharted heavens. Because of what the intense and demanding journey to world class, as well as the experience of superstardom, has drained out of them. Threat 2. The threat of energetic diversion. Fame, fortune and massive influence bring with them other unexpected dangers that you'd be wise to protect yourself against well in advance of reaching these conditions. When I work one-on-one -on -one with a high-profile client or in my Circle of Legends online mentoring curriculum, I provide a template that allows the leader to work through their threats and vulnerabilities when it comes to operating at world-class and then their pivots and protections. I give you full access to this worksheet at the end of the chapter, so you get to do this powerful exercise yourself. As you travel in the stratosphere of rare air, you'll face enthusiastic attacks from jealous critics and angry trolls who were activated by seeing you soar to such heights. Your success triggers their pain at seeing their potential unfulfilled and excites their self-loathing on not delivering on their own dreams. If you're not careful, these people will steal your energy. As well, as you ascend, you'll receive exponentially more invitations to pursue amazing opportunities that have nothing to do with your sweet spot. You'll attract new friends who want to hang with you, just because it's cool to be seen with you. You might face lawsuits from business partners who want your money and relationship hassles arising from the fact you spent so much time consumed with making your mesmerizing ambitions real that you neglected other parts of your life. I've seen all of this happen with many of my clients. So I'm telling you the way it is. With all of this to deal with, just imagine what happens to the creative, productive and performance energy that caused the greatness to happen? Please think through how you will manage all of this far ahead of reaching the summits of your private Mount Everests. Threat 3. The threat of lifestyle complexity. Related to threat 2 are the layers of complication that any world-class producer must face when it comes to their lifestyle. You see, when a superstar is just starting out as an anonymous performer, there is often an exceptional purity of focus. The startup entrepreneur is pretty much only concentrated on scaling their business. The pro athlete, not yet a champion, spends their days pretty much only training, eating, receiving coaching and sleeping. The brilliant musical artist, before virtuosity and adulation hit, is living in a Spartan studio apartment, eating ramen noodles and working in the studio all night, generating the magic that will eventually entertain millions. Yet once the company becomes a publicly traded unicorn, making the founder a multi-billionaire, and the athlete's abilities make them an icon, and the musician's gifts make them a global sensation, everything gets complex. The big money flowing often goes to buy homes, cars, private jet travel and an entourage of managers, security and other staff, each of whom has to be paid, all based on the false assumption that the success they are experiencing will last many years. It rarely does, leaving many once successful people bankrupt. I must repeat this one more time, because it is so extremely important, one of the largest of all snares of superstardom is the belief that once successful, always successful. So many A-listers reach the apex and think that, because they are at the top they somehow cannot ever be removed from the top. They fall into the psychological trap of believing that because they are winning now, they will always be winning. 
because they are selling a ton of albums, they will always sell a lot of albums. Because they are generating a ton of income, they will always make a lot of income. So they stop improving, stop saving, stop getting up early, stop exercising and stop running their lives at excellence. This generally leads to disaster. Threat 4. The threat of success fed hubris. Perhaps the most common mistake I see some of the luminaries I work with make is becoming arrogant. Gross inflation of the human ego is the largest occupational hazard of the world-class leader, whether they operate in business, sports, the arts and sciences, or politics. It seems to me that with all the fortune, elite achievement and people telling you that you walk on water, the ego gets fed to the point of hubris. Hubris is defined as excessive pride and exaggerated confidence. The mistake most successful companies suffer from is also descending into hubris. They forget that their customers are their real bosses and discount the fact that their competition could make them irrelevant in an instant if they stop innovating, delivering extreme benefit and delighting the people who keep them in business. If they become more concerned with having an office tower named after their enterprise than enriching their clients. Same thing can happen to title holders and athletic champions. They fall in love with their win and think that, because champagne was poured over their heads on the night of their monumental victory, next year's championship ring is already on their pinky finger. They start missing practices, being rude to their fans, picking fights with peers, drinking too much, eating too much, gambling too much and failing to remain focused on advancing the genius that won them the crown. They lose what I call in my mentoring curriculum the blue-collar mincet and the white belt mentality that made them masters. I think of the captain of an NBA championship winning team as I write this. Rather than taking the summer off, as is standard in the game, he showed up, the day after his triumph, at 5 a.m. to start practice. And begin the process of becoming even better. Threat 5, the threat of reaching good enough. So, to get to the top, you pretty much have to do what pretty much no one's doing. Remember my brain tattoo, to have what only 5% of the population have, you must be willing to do what 95% of the population is. Unwilling to do. Extremely hard work, an unforgettable work ethic beats natural talent every day of the week, tons of sacrifices, which really don't feel like sacrifices, because you love what you do so much, installing exceptional habits, dealing with detractors and constantly having to find solutions to problems are the fees you must pay to gain admission into the very quiet and mostly empty halls of domain dominance. Sure, the rewards make it totally worth it. And, absolutely, what the journey to world class and living your heroic ideals make you into as a human being is a treasure more valuable than all the jewels in a diamond mine. Yet another major threat you'll face when you near the peak of success is that you'll start to coast. Guaranteed you'll experience this phenomenon. You've accomplished more than anyone you know. You've achieved more breathtaking results than even you thought you would. You're pretty much untouchable in terms of your craft, income, lifestyle and impact. A huge part of you will be attracted to simply enjoying the fruits of your labor. Do you want to play more golf or travel for most of the year? or accept the level of performance you're at. You may even allow the deadly thought of retirement into your energetic orbit. Please don't ever retire, I plead with you. It will age you and dim your bright light. Look, if you think and feel like this at the height of your powers, fine by me. It's your life. And one path isn't any better, in truth, than another. But accepting good enough won't keep you in the rare air of the Grandmaster, which means there's just no way you'll ever reach legendary. Just saying. Threat 6, the threat of reputation deterioration. When you reach the zenith of your field, people will try to take you down. Jealous competitors see a target on your back, detractors who are angry because you've done what they couldn't do, will manufacture reasons to criticize you, and attackers will come out of the woodwork. Be prepared for this. And know this isn't happening because you've done something wrong. It's a sign that you've done everything right. Just be aware there's a strong chance that malicious people with unhealthy agendas will try to degrade your hard-earned reputation and cancel your uneasily won good name. I caution you to plan for this threat so you can put excellent protections in place. Because should you lose your reputation, 
you've lost one of your foremost assets. The other scenario to consider here is the case where, because of all your success, your ego consumes your better judgment and you actually do something foolish. That destroys your high standing. Again, just think through all this, so you can avoid these pitfalls, that I've personally witnessed, so many supreme performers fall into. Threat 7, the threat of human mortality. We're all going to die. The key is to postpone your demise for, as long as possible. Just imagine applying the latest scientific breakthroughs on life extension along. With time-tested habits such as early morning exercise, daily meditation, cold exposure, sauna and light therapy, forest bathing, intermittent fasting, therapeutic massage, acupuncture and nutritional supplementation, to fireproof your health, so that via the transformational power of epigenetics you recalibrate your longevity, giving you many, many, many more years to upgrade your mastery, scale your wealth, serve society, and enjoy the personal rewards you've earned on your rise to and lifetime at monumental success. All right. There you have them. The primary dangers to sustain domain dominance. I invite you to reread the seven threats to world class and then to construct the framework as it applies to you. In my own strategy sessions, I often think through how I wish things to play out 50 years ahead. Then I reverse engineer it all in meticulous detail on whiteboards back to today. You can access the worksheet my clients find so valuable here, the EverettHairManifesto.com 7 Threats Worksheet. I hope this helps you protect and amplify your superstardom for a lifetime. 30. Expect ungrateful. Please don't judge me as cynical. But I've mentally conditioned myself to expect ungrateful. Here's what I mean. In Norman Vincent Peale's positive thinking classic called, well, the power of positive thinking, the ceaselessly optimistic minister encourages us to expect ingratitude. As I understand it, his point is that most people will never truly appreciate your goodness and gentleness. It's just not generally human nature, at this stage of our species' evolution. So why lose peace of mind and valuable creative energy hoping to receive it? I'll put it another way, avoid becoming an injustice collector. That way of seeing the world just beats you down and rips you up. Accept the fact that the majority of people concentrate on what they didn't get versus all you gave and remember what you didn't do for them, rather than the wealth of generosity you showered upon them. And remember that someone else's lack of appreciation or good manners or grace or compassion or sense of fairness really has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. People treat other people the way they treat themselves. So why make it about you? Just stay true to your own moral instincts. Display the virtues of positivity, honesty, goodwill, excellence, humility, forgiveness and respect to all, with a clear understanding that very few will ever acknowledge your integrity and stainless character. Do good anyhow. 31. That time I was left alone at the top of a mountain. I can't make up some of the things that have happened in my life. You may laugh at me when I share this one with you. Yet that's cool with me, if my story serves your ascension into your highest mode of operating. And so. When I was in my 40s, I had the idea of becoming a professional ski instructor. I've always loved the mountains and the thought of skiing down them with some skill really spoke to me. To breathe some life into this ambition, I enrolled in weekly classes with a wonderful mentor and worked enormously hard to increase my ability. The progress was slow, yet I steadily made improvement. After two years of lessons, I spent a freezing week in the certification class on the slopes and received my level 1 professional ski instructor qualification, which allowed me to teach beginning students. I still recall the day I went to collect my ski pro uniform, that blue jacket, those black snow pants. I brought my beloved children into the building with me. And as we left with my uniform in hand, I began to dance. Yes, I danced. Although I still had a heavy international speaking schedule, I secured a job at our local ski resort, at minimum wage. And every few days, when I wasn't on an airplane, I'd rise at 4 a.m., drive the two-hour drive, often in snowstorms, and help little kids learn to ski. It was a marvelous time of my life. The day I collected my ski instructor uniform. Around that time, I decided to take a solo trip abroad, 
so I could develop the technique of skiing big mountains. So I packed up my gear, got on a flight, and flew to a faraway place with towering peaks, higher than I'd ever seen. Each morning I'd hop onto a bus with chains on its tires that would wind its way through tiny villages and then up the thin and treacherous ice-covered road that led to the base of a vast mountain. Each evening, after a nap, I'd quietly work on the book I was writing, it was the leader who had no title, and then, in solitude, cook a simple meal made of fresh ingredients in my austere kitchen, eating what I'd made while sitting on a weather-beaten chair outside under the stars. After about a week, a friend I'd made invited me to hell a ski with him. If you're not familiar with the term, it means pretty much what it says. You climb into a helicopter and then fly over a bunch of summits until you arrive at the top of the mountain you're going to ski down. It's a pursuit reserved for experts. And by making the wrong move, one could easily die. On the designated day, the helicopter lifted off in exquisite sunshine and amid fantastically blue skies. As we passed mountain after mountain, my heartbeat started to quicken. Droplets of sweat formed under my helmet, and my goggles started to fog up. The aircraft landed at the absolute highest point of a colossally high peak. Four other skiers and I jumped out into the fresh snow. Then the helicopter flew away. You won't believe what happened next. The other skiers were total pros. And it was assumed that I was one as well. I was far too proud to reveal my fear, and much too embarrassed to explain my relative inability. Here's the thing, thanks to my training at my local hill, yes, it was far more a hill than a mountain, I was a fairly skilled skier on regular snow. But skiing on the soft, billowy powder snow that you will find on giant mountains is a completely different game. It's similar to the difference between being a good swimmer in your community pool and navigating the ocean on intense endurance swims and I'd never really skied under these kinds of conditions. Ever. The guide went first, to ensure all was safe, and to protect us against avalanches. Next went my friend and his wife, both clearly superb at the sport. I heard them hooting with childlike glee as they made fresh tracks in the virgin snow. Then a young, but experienced ski pro took off. He must have been 30. The way he skied, made me feel like I was 90. I was left completely alone. On the top of a staggeringly tall mountain. Never having skied powder. I prayed for my life. Thought of my kids. And then wiped the buckets of sweat from my shiny forehead. Here's the photo taken, just before everyone else went down ahead of me, so you'll have even the smallest sense of my experience. Life, I've discovered, sometimes, always, sends you scenarios perfectly designed to teach you the lessons you most need to learn to get to the next grade of your growth. Remember what I shared earlier about things never unfolding for your failure, and everything always happening in your favor, even when it doesn't seem that way? I've also learned that we are most alive when we are closest to our fears. Confronted with our doubt that we can get through a difficulty, we are pushed to own gifts we never knew we had. And once we are introduced to these special powers, we can choose to associate with them for the remainder of our days and thereby eventually know the fullness of our human greatness. And so. I leaned into my terror and inched ahead, with legs shaking like teacups during an earthquake, and a mouth drier than the empty quarter of the Arabian Peninsula. I kid you not, I regressed into the snowplow, the first position of the starting skier. It just made me feel more secure. What unfolded next was a hot mess. A middle-aged man skiing down an immense mountain, curled over my skis, mostly off balance and screaming for my mommy, at the top of my lungs. Okay, the part about screaming for my mommy isn't true, everything else is. I promise. Of course, I eventually made it to safety. My companions were aghast. Yet they spoke no words. Their empathy for my calamity screamed so much louder. On the helicopter flight back to the terminal, I reflected on the experience. I felt happy that I'd said yes to it. Because real failure lies in not even trying. And, as human beings, we become far stronger when we venture out onto the tough runs rather than coast along on the easy slopes. Sure unchallenging trails appear to be so much safer. Yet they end up being far more dangerous. Because they smother the boldness, aliveness and 
bigness that is all we truly are. I was offered an opportunity. I gave it my best. I look foolish. I grew in wisdom, toughness, and acumen. And I made it back to my apartment. Just in time for dinner under the stars. 32. The Peak Productivity Strategies Pyramid. Full disclosure, this is a chapter for heavyweights, or grandmasters in the making only. If you are not interested in being one, no sweat, simply go ahead to the next chapter. Dot. But if you are, bravo, please roll up your sleeves, turn up your attention and fully embrace what you're about to learn. Because it's exceedingly valuable. The learning framework I'm about to share will bring you superb tactical benefit as you electrify the productivity that will make your mark on history. In this time of crushing digital addiction, unyielding superficial interruption and massive attraction to online amusements that don't matter, it has never been more essential to understand how industry titans and artistic champions shield their virtuosity so they become consistent producers of masterworks. It's challenging enough to shift from performing fake work to real work. You now know how important it is not to confuse being busy with being productive. It's even harder to regularly send work into the field that represents genius to your quality. And to ensure this keeps happening for you, decade after decade. I call this practice being a multiple masterwork producer, and it's a wise standard to honor. Before I walk you through the system, I wish to provide some context and mention the triad of productivity principles. Principle 1, cognitive bandwidth deserves a fortress around it. Cognitive bandwidth is a term used by Princeton psychologist Elder Schaffer to describe the limited amount of attention the human brain has available each day. His research has found that people dealing with poverty, for example, experience tunneling such that their worries and stress consume much of their cognitive power, leaving little for other tasks. This, in turn, causes them to access less of their native intellectual brilliance and connect with lower amounts of their natural ingenuity to solve problems, seize opportunities and materialize the wholeness of their inherent productivity that would raise them into greater prosperity. Worries, crisis and tragedy, as well as spending our concentration on digital escapism, drain our cognitive bandwidth, leaving us with less focus and genius to accomplish amazing feats. Principle 2. Attention residue must be managed for mastery. Closely related to cognitive bandwidth is the phenomenon of attention residue first advanced by Sophie Leroy, a business school professor at the University of Minnesota. Essentially, attention residue speaks to the molecules of your focus that you leave on one activity when you shift to another one. Every single move you make carries a creative cost with it. People who are constantly checking their devices, for example, soon suffer from digital dementia because each time they check for a message or look for a like, they leave a fraction of their valuable cognitive bandwidth on that activity. Do this daily, as many do, and you'll be installing fragmented attention disorder as your general way of being. You'll never get anything sensational done. Principle 3. Productive exhaustion requires scheduled renewal. Productive exhaustion is a phrase from my coaching curriculum that explains what happens when an advanced performer works intensely for long periods of time. Specifically, as you elevate your productivity and the expertise you bring to your arena, you will regularly experience cycles of vigorous intellectual, emotional, physical and spiritual fatigue. This weariness is not a marker that there's something wrong, but a signal that you're doing everything right. When you're showing up with incendiary passion and fiery commitment to produce nothing less than masterwork, you'll often be left depleted because you are fully using your capacities, gifts and primal assets. This will cause productive exhaustion. The solution? Regularly scheduled rest and refueling cycles. A special ability means a heavy expenditure of energy in a particular direction, with a consequent rain from some other side of life, wrote the fabled psychologist Carlying. Okay, let's study the peak productivity strategies pyramid together. The peak productivity strategies pyramid. Strategy 1, the lifetime big five. Many years ago, on one of my first trips to the South Africa that I so love, my client organized a safari for me. The guide who spent the day with us spoke of the big five, the most powerful animals of all African wildlife. They are the lion, leopard, buffalo, rhino, and elephant. 
That evening, after an unforgettable day on the savannah, I pulled out my journal to download and to construct the day I'd been blessed to experience. I then asked myself this transformational question, what are my big five? In other words, what are the top five priorities that I needed to commit to spending the rest of my life hunting down? I've lived under these five primary beacons since that evening, and the lifetime big five idea has elevated my productivity enormously since then. Clarity breeds mastery, right? You'll never hit high-value targets that you don't even know about. Recording the five central aims to which you'll devote the remainder of your days will bring extreme purity of focus to your hours, days, weeks, months, quarters and years, insulating your cognitive bandwidth as well as promoting exceptional economy of your energy. The foundation of exceptionalism is harnessing your genius around only a few things, so you get strikingly good at them. I've always loved the following advice of Thomas Edison, the standout inventor, you do something all day long, don't you? Everyone does. If you get up at 7 o'clock and go to bed at 11, you have put in 16 good hours, and it is certain with most people that they have been doing something all the time. They have been either walking, or reading, or writing, or thinking. The only trouble is that they do it about a great many things and I do it about one. If they took the time in question, and applied it in one direction, to one object, they would succeed. Strategy 2. The Deep 5 Values I know it seems obvious, but your most closely cherished values define what you most value. And knowing them intimately is completely essential to an existence of maximum authenticity and elite productivity. Betraying what your spirit wants you to stand for creates what I call an integrity gap, because the way your worldly self is operating is inconsistent with how the heroic part of you wishes to behave. This major misalignment absorbs vast amounts of energy and creativity, which could be used to accomplish world-class results. Because your wisdom watches you not honoring the true you. The key here is to become ultra-aware of your deep five values, so you stay loyal to them. You never want to lead someone else's life and arrive at your last day, only to realize that you spend your finest hours on pursuits that were meaningless to you. With the wish that it helps you, I'll share that my own deep five values are personal mastery, dedication to family, total craft artistry, the experience of ongoing beauty and humble service to society. Strategy 3. The Heavyweight 6. Most of the exponential productivity gains and related income, lifestyle and spiritual growth of my clients comes through their near-religious practice of a handful of habits I've encouraged them to implement. I call these six regimes the SOPs of AUK, the standard operating procedures of absolute world class. Train on these to the point of automaticity, where they become easier to do than not to do, and you'll receive what I call a GCA gargantuan competitive advantage that very few peers will ever be able to match. Extraordinary performance really is fairly easy to realize because so few are doing the things that extraordinary performance requires. There's just not a lot of competition in the rare air of virtuosity. Yes, the lower ground is very crowded. But there aren't many human beings inhabiting the stratosphere of their highest genius. Because so few among us know what to do, and then execute regularly with near flawless precision around what needs to be done to get there. Here are the six daily routines that have given the luminaries I mentor the greatest productive results. 1. Joining the 5 a.m. club and spending a victory hour upgrading your mindset, purifying your heartset, optimizing your heelset and escalating your soulset. The way you start your day really does have an outsized impact on each of the remaining hours. Begin your mornings with 60 minutes of self-strengthening, and you'll experience consistently positive, prolific and beautiful days. And as the Spartan warriors used to say, sweat more in training, and you'll bleed less in war. 2. Writing for at least 10 minutes every day in a gratitude journal so, as to crowd out the negativity bias of the human brain and make soaring thankfulness your automatic default. One of the most powerful interventions science confirms, will make us, not only more effective but happier is the daily three good things exercise, where you simply know three small wins or uplifting experiences each evening. As Martin Seligman, the father of positive psychology, wrote in his book Flourish, for sound evolutionary reasons, most of us are not nearly as good at dwelling on good events as we are at analyzing bad events. 
those of our ancestors who spent a lot of time basking in the sunshine of good events when they should have been preparing for disaster did not survive the Ice Age. So to overcome our brain's natural catastrophic bent, we need to work on and practice the skill of thinking about what went well. 3. Doing the second wind workout, 2 WW, ideally, a nature walk, that I mentioned in the chapter guard good health like a pro athlete. I personally find that my life works a whole lot better when I train myself to be a whole lot fitter. And doing two fitness sessions a day will deliver this benefit to you. 4. Running the 60-minute student regime, which means that you do not go to sleep unless you've spent at least an hour during the day immersed in study, such as reading a book that promotes your leadership growth, listening to an audiobook on relationship building or empire making, or taking an online course that enriches your domain knowledge so you have the ability to produce rich streams of reward for the customers you serve. 5. The 90-90 it's one rule, which is a habit I originally set up to help my mastermind participants block out the relentless distractions they were facing each morning. Essentially, for the next 90 days, create an ironclad and uninterruptible ritual such that the first 90 minutes of your work morning is monomaniacally focused on your single finest opportunity to lead your field. You never want to deploy your most valuable hours on least valuable activities. 6. The Weekly Design System, which is a methodology I developed to ensure that my coaching clients not only generate extreme gains in their productivity, but also maintain a terrifically balanced life. Life balance is not a myth. I'll teach you the entire system in a coming chapter and I can confirm that the process will be a total game changer for you. For now, simply know that the tasks that you schedule are the tasks that get done. And that consistently scheduling prodigy grade weeks is a potent gateway into sustained superstardom. And a life of superb health, generous love and limitless joyfulness. If you would like to watch a video where I teach the entire procedure, visit the everettahermanifesto.com weekly design system strategy for the expert support team. Another early practice when I start a mentorship engagement with a CEO or an entrepreneurial heavyweight is to set up a team of expert counselors to ensure they transcend past victories and swiftly execute on the mission they have brought me in to help them achieve. This strategy is similar to the team enlisted to support a world champion professional athlete. It's impossible to reach mastery level performance alone. Most top athletes invest in a mincet coach to keep their thinking at its best, a physical therapist to keep them injury free, a nutritionist to calibrate their diet and supplementation plan, and a strategist to help them improve their play. At the very least, I recommend that, budget permitting, you find the finest personal trainer you can to help you get into the strongest fitness you've ever been in. Yes, this will cost you money, and I learned this from Warren Buffett, while the average performers get stuck on the cost of something, super producers focus on the return on investment that will flow from the spending. Going for what's cheapest will turn out to be very expensive. Or as Aldo Gucci said sagely, quality is remembered long after price is forgotten. Engaging a superb personal trainer to push you to get uber healthy will completely transform your creativity, artistry and impact, along with dramatically increasing your income, because you'll be more energetic, resilient and inspired. You'll never work out as hard alone as you will with a trainer, keeping you accountable. Working with a deeply skilled fitness coach has allowed me to experience the energy and good health to write my books, travel illness-free globally for decades, and do all the things I love to do with my family, while still having time for myself. I also instruct my clients to find a skilled massage therapist, so they can run the two massage protocol, by receiving two 90-minute massages each week, which boosts their positivity enormously, allows them to get up at 5 a.m. more easily, and extends their lifespan considerably. Along with all of this, we set them up with a premier psychotherapist, so the repressed emotional baggage I mentioned in the piece on trauma no longer silently sucks their productivity, and we get clients attending a functional medicine clinic for biohacking, so that they reverse aging and dissolve cognitive decline. Finally, we ensure clients work monthly with a spiritual counselor to access their highest self. Again, you can't get to best in world on your own. 
Set up your support team of ultra experts as soon as you can. Strategy 5. The Forced Optimization Strategy, FOES, Life Structure. Another leading edge life regime that will rapidly accelerate your productivity, income and impact is the forced optimization strategy. One of the real reasons we don't execute on our intentions, commitments, and deliverables is that it's just too easy not to, right? Fail to rise at 5 a.m. and do your morning run, and you generally only have your unhappy conscience to deal with. Miss A. Session that you've scheduled to analyze your finances or increase your career performance, or get the massage that will replenish your diminished reserves, and mostly there's not much of a backlash. And so we get sloppy around our disciplines. And then find some feeble excuse for our failure to keep our promises, yes, of course, this happens to me at times too. The antidote to this weakness? Force the optimization of the routine that you want to integrate into your lifestyle. Just go ahead and foes it. For example, let's say you desire to be in the best physical condition of your life 90 days from now. Completely possible. For sure. And let's say you want to get to this result via getting up at daybreak on weekdays and installing the habit of an intense morning workout so you consistently enjoy marvelous days. Most people will stop after a week. Maybe they'll last two. Yet by hiring an excellent personal trainer to show up at your home or at your gym, even if only twice a week, for three months, you force the optimization of the new routine. Because you now have some skin in the game by investing your hard-earned money. And because this human being will be at your front door at the time you've agreed or at the exercise studio is scheduled. Or let's say you wish to lock and load on my two massage protocol then find the best masseuse in your community and pay for two sessions each week for the next quarter. Now you'll just have to go, because you've booked the meetings and paid the fees. Do you force the optimization of the habit into your life? Implement the foe's life structure across multiple areas of your world and you'll quickly and enduringly translate your current good intentions to lead an extraordinary life into the daily results that make glory real. Strategy 6. The Tight Bubble of Total Focus, TBTF, Concept. This is another remarkably valuable mental construct to set yourself up for peerless productivity. This method will organize your workdays so that you defeat the war against distractions, interruptions and getting caught up in trivial pursuits. Celebrated artists, mighty billionaires, Excellent athletes and world champion scientists all have the same allotment of 24 hours each day as you and I. Yet the way they interact with these hours is diametrically different from how the majority manage themselves. The TBTF concept encourages you to build a metaphorical wall around what I call in my work the five assets of genius. These are your mental focus, your physical energy, your personal willpower, your daily time and your primal gifts. Using the TBTF concept, you fashion your entire professional life so as to work within a tight bubble of extreme focus with a porous barrier that allows and only influences that protect your positivity, fuel your craft, nourish your talent, and elevate your public service. Negative stimuli such as superficial social media influencers, videos of people performing silly tricks or awkward dances, the mainstream news, toxic people attempting to pour cold water on your bright flame, uninvited digital messages, endless notifications mostly about nothing, and pretty much any activity that doesn't allow you to make astronomical progress on your lifetime big five do not get to cross the barrier. A giant key to exponential productivity is battleproofing your focus. This powerful strategy helps you do it. You'll become fanatically and prodigiously focused around the few major priorities that will allow you to make the whispers of your heart, the longings of your wisdom and the callings of your everyday heroism come true before this precious window of opportunity closes, and it will. Once inside this figurative work pocket, your TBTF will make sure things that don't matter never begin to matter. Here's the real point. To integrate at the level of felt knowing versus simply an intellectual idea, one of the secrets of the immortal geniuses is seclusion. And the discipline of retreating from the world by placing themselves in a form of solitary confinement so they could produce their magic. All of history's great makers had this habit in common. They set up their workspaces to be completely diversion-free, 
so they could get lost from society for extended periods of time, every day. Think of Thomas Edison's Menlo Park Lab. Or Telegraph Cottage, the small, private country house that General Dwight D. Eisenhower used as a refuge during World War II. His staff was very careful not to have anything in the cottage that would remind him of the war, so it would provide full relief from the pressures he was under, allowing him to think clearly about his strategy and campaign. Your creative rabbit hole can be metaphorical. You can take the approach of simply blocking out distractions and locking away your devices, so you create your magnum opus in a few solid time blocks each workday. Or you can actually set up a specific artistic space where you go dark, so no one and no thing can drain your cognitive bandwidth and productivity. Doing this daily is an extraordinary way to institutionalize flow state, so your brilliance begins to visit you on demand. Or you can go work in a library, in the study hall of a nearby university, or within a spare bedroom. When I have a key project to complete, I'll often book a beautiful hotel room in a favorite city for a few weeks. Sometimes I'll book a suite in my own hometown, just to get away from my usual responsibilities in the operational administrivia that never serves me in generating my best results. As a matter of fact, as I refine this paragraph for you, I'm in a hotel room an hour away from my house, with inspiring music playing, a privacy sign on my door, my phone on do not disturb, and zero meetings or media scheduled. All I need to do here is work, real work, eat, room service, and sleep, good bed. Yes, it costs me money that I wouldn't have to spend if I were working at home this week. Yet missing the ideas and the creativity that are flowing would cost me a thousand times more. Here's the photo of the current scene, the work area in the hotel room, where I'm writing this chapter strategy 7, the 5 great hours promise. The old style of working is derived from an ancient era when people worked on factory lines and mostly toiled as manual laborers. By producing longer, more goods would be made until the worker grew fatigued and the next shift took over. We live now at a very different time. Many of us are paid to think and invent and to find splendid solutions to the planet's greatest problems. Many of us are cognitive laborers rather than physical workers. Working longer, therefore, does not serve us better because working long hours depletes our creativity and degrades our mastery. This is why I don't resonate with the whole hustle and grind culture at all. The most productive people on the planet do not hustle and grind 24-7-365. Instead, when they work, they work with supreme intensity. They do not snack on digital amusements or foolishly chit-chat about TV shows when they show up to advance their craft and pursue their trade. They are serious. They are professionals, not dabblers. Specialists instead of generalists. They go super deep versus really wide when they work. When they sit down to produce, they bring the fullness of their human genius to the table and spend it all on their occupation. Then, once done with the work session, they are new. They nap. They play. They enjoy the fruits of their industry and the joys of their effort. This way of working, in cycles, is one of the utmost of all secrets to peerless productivity and a gorgeous life. I'm a huge fan of the Indian painter M. F. Hussain, often called the Picasso of India. When a reporter for The Guardian asked the artistic legend, how he organized his days, he replied, I work early. Get up at 5 or 6. I always feel it's my first day. I don't get bored with sunrise. I then work hard for 3 or 4 hours. And what would he do for the rest of the day, the interviewer asked. Ah, the rest of the time I think it is very important just to loiter around. Just to loiter around. Love it. And so, I recommend that my clients work only 5 hours a day, to me, Five hours of undisturbed, fierce, steady and exquisite work is ideal, on those days reserved for work. Anything more is completely unnecessary, and actually leads to diminishing returns because you're tired, so you won't produce anything substantial, so why waste the time? Just five hours of glorious, majestic monumental achievement on your work days. Then recover. Regenerate. Refuel. And savor the rest of your day. Those I advise almost always initially resist the five great hours promises it's so unorthodox, heretical, actually. Yet once they observe 
that they are actually getting more world-class work done in a week than they previously accomplished in many months by working less, they thank me. And use the enormous amounts of time they freed up to be with their family, read the books in their home library, visit art galleries, commune with nature or pursue their sporting passions. Strategy 8. The World Class Executive Assistant Plus Personal Aid, WCAPA, Foundation. Okay. Almost done on this chapter, which I know has been intense yet will be priceless once you implement it. Titans of industry have told me that this particular strategy I'm about to walk you through has multiplied their financial fortunes, activated explosive gains in their performance, and genuinely revolutionized their personal lives, bringing far more happiness, balance and spiritual peace. It continually astounds me how many super elite executives, revered billionaires and standout entrepreneurs still do many of the things they did when they first started out, like booking their own travel, making restaurant reservations, supervising home repairs and going to the store for their daily supplies. Why would they do this at the level they are at? Force of habit. They've done it so many times it's all become unconscious. Yet this behavior, which served them well in startup stage, now consumes many hours each day that could be used in advancing their lifetime big five, making their masterwork, polishing their skills, accelerating their empires, growing their movements and making a difference in the lives of many other human beings. Hiring a talented and trusted person, a world-class executive assistant plus personal aid to organize and orchestrate your professional life as well as elegantly manage your personal life will free up immense bandwidth, energy and time for you. Your WCAPA can manage all scheduling, answer all calls, deal with all complexity and essentially handle every single one of the activities that you dislike. Just imagine the improvement in your productivity, happiness, and serenity as you concentrate purely on all those things it's smartest for you to do. That you're excellent at. And that you love doing. This method is a major way to create a life you adore. Strategy 9. The Weekly Sabbatical. During a simpler period in history, one day a week, known as the Sabbath, was reserved for a vacation of sorts from one's labor. Families united, the plows were paused, books were read, and meals were shared. The final standard operating system of the peak productivity strategies pyramid is to get exceedingly good at taking days off. At least one day each week, and then, I hope, one week off every month and eventually at least two months away from work every year. Shift from being a human doing to a human being, and relax a lot more. We really do receive our best ideas when we're not working. And you'll never lead the field, if you're really worn out. As I've shared, Longevity is a primary ingredient to become legendary, and by taking an uncommon amount of weekly, monthly, and yearly sabbaticals to be with your family, take great trips, read great books, develop great friendships and simply rest, you'll ensure that you're creative, inspired, skilled and ultra-strong for many many more decades. Okay. That's it. Many of my best strategies for peak productivity offered with high encouragement and sincere enthusiasm. So you can explore your cathedrals of possibility. And inhabit your temples of promise. I pray it helps you raise your game exponentially. P.S. To download a tactical worksheet that will help. You implement the peak productivity strategies pyramid swiftly and effectively. Go to theeveredhairmanifesto.com productivity. 33. Join the Hope Brigade. I'd like to share more of my poetry with you. So, as Ben Harper's song Excuse Me Mr. shakes the floor of my writing room, I gently offer you these words, where there is darkness and doom, and the people feel defeated, know that doubt is the great swindler. And join the Hope Brigade. When you are punished for your truthfulness, where you are misunderstood for your genius, rebel against such cowardice. And join the Hope Brigade. In times of misfortune, when you think of quitting, when fear enchants your counterfeit self, where despair does its violence, silence the enemies within. Recall your ability to perform acts of wizardry. And join the Hope Brigade. The flock will beckon you to become like them. To live noisily, and to crave well beyond plenty. To disregard your nature and dishonor your power. To stifle your instinct for simplicity to allow the attractions of ordinary to invade your hours. 
refuse this request of the majority by knowing the fury of your sovereignty and join the hope brigade when you wonder if you matter while remembering that you are mortal in the mornings of your delicious angst consider the serenity at the root of your bravery proceed resolutely amid any uncertainty and join the hope brigade has love torn your heart does life seem too hard do you feel alone is adversity more common than triumph has worry welcomed you more than cheer a new dawn is coming the fruits of your goodness will soon be showing have faith in fortune's fairness and join the hope brigade 34 40 things i wish i'd known at 40 1 that family flowers and walks in the woods would bring me more happiness than cars watches and houses ever would 2 that getting super fit would multiply my creativity productivity and prosperity considerably 3 that your choice of relationship partner is one of the main sources of your success or failure joy or misery and tranquility or worry 4 that i do my finest work when i'd be working in hotel rooms and flying on airplanes rather than when chained to an office desk 5 that good friendships are priceless treasures and that old friends are the most precious ones 6. That heaven helps those who help themselves. So do your best, and let your higher power do the rest. 7. That people putting you down is a sign of your increasing success. 8. That the priorities I thought were most important in my youth are actually the pursuits I'm least interested in as I mature. 9. That silence, stillness and solitude form the sweet song that most attracts the muse. 10. That small daily victories, performed with disciplined consistency over extended periods of time, lead to revolutionary results. 11. That when I didn't get what I desired it was because the universe had something a whole lot better in mind. 12. That being scared just means you're about to grow. And that frequent discomfort is the price of accelerated progress. 13. That if you risk all for love, and it doesn't work out, there is no failure, because all love stories are, in truth, hero tales. And no growth of the heart is a waste. Ever. 14. That working diligently without concern for the rewards is the very behavior that brings the rewards. 15. That just because someone is aging doesn't mean they are growing. 16. That life has a fabulous feedback system showing you what you are doing right by where you are winning and what you need to improve by where you're frustrated. 17. That it usually takes 20 years of working anonymously before you acquire the wisdom and expertise required to know what to leave out of a piece of work, so it becomes extraordinary. 18. That the humbler the person, the stronger the character. 19. That your income will never exceed your self-identity. And your impact will never be larger than your personal story. 20. That we get what we settle for. So stop settling for what you don't want. 21. That sometimes silence is the loudest reply you can give. 22. That the way people make you feel when you interact with them tells you everything you need to know about them. 23. That taking a lot of time off would make me twice as productive. 24. That feeding the trolls is a waste of your time. Most critics are jealous because you did what they couldn't do. Ignore them and allow mastery to be your response. 25. That bullies become cowards once you stand up to them. 26. That journaling is praying on paper. And every prayer is heard. 27. That a genuinely rich life costs a lot less than you think. 28. That some people in business will tell you they'll do amazing things for you, but once the deal is signed, they'll end up doing nothing for you. 29. That the activities in places that fill you with joy are the activities in places where your wisdom wishes you to be. 30. That the best use of money is to create experiences and memories and not to secure objects and possessions. 31. That willpower is built by doing difficult things. So do more difficult things. Daily. 32. That it's better to read a few books deeply than consume many books lightly. 33. That hardship is the birthplace of heroism. Honor your scars as they have made you you. 34. 
that the majority of human beings have wonderful hearts, and they'll show them to you, if you make them feel safe. 35. That elderly people have the best stories. And deserve the highest respect. 36. That old life has huge value. Don't ever step on a spider. 37. That when you feel most alone, your higher power is closest to you. 38. That not every hour of the day, and not every day of the week needs to be used productively in grinding. Taking naps, staring at the stars, and, sometimes, doing nothing are pursuits absolutely necessary for a life of unlimited beauty. 39. That respecting yourself is vastly more important than being liked by others. 40. That life's too short to play small with your highness. 35. The Misty Copeland Confidence Making Technique. Misty Copeland, a hero to millions of humans, is one of the best ballerinas our civilization has ever produced. She was the first African-American woman to become principal dancer at the prestigious American Ballet Theater and has held audiences spellbound through her performances at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York, the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow and the Bunka Kagan in Tokyo. She's also a shining example of using a mean childhood filled with parental alcoholism, regular uprooting and relentless adversity as fuel to achieve the apparently impossible. As a young ballerina, she would rise before dawn to start her practice regime, understanding that outworking everyone around you is how dreamers transmute potential into power. Naturally blessed, along with exceptionally dedicated, a formidable alchemy, she was able to stand end point on her toes in special ballet shoes to perform specific dance moves, only months after her first ballet class, in a field where it generally takes practitioners many years to arrive at this ability. When no one else had faith in Copeland's ability, to realize awesome results as a performer, her first teacher caught glimpses of her prodigiousness and encouraged her unusual pupil to continue when she wanted to quit. The perfect ballerina has a small head, sloping shoulders, long legs and a narrow rib cage, the instructor said, echoing celebrated choreographer George Balanchine's much-respected statement on the attributes of a ballet superstar. That's you, whispered her teacher one day in class you're perfect. As the days passed and Copeland's training dedication deepened, the way her mentor saw her gradually reordered the way she saw herself. As Copeland gained skill, refined her prowess, and upgraded her performance, her self-identity rose in the process. She began to accept that she was special and talented and perhaps even gifted. World class is very much a game of confidence. And becoming a sensation in your arena, begins by strengthening the trust you have in yourself. The quickest and most sustainable technique for building such psychological undefeatability and emotional hardiness is to behave as the person that you most seek to become. As esteemed psychologists suggest, it's easier to act yourself into a new way of thinking than to think yourself into a new way of acting. Please read that maxim twice. You'll build your own confidence through relentless practice rather than mere hopefulness. The smallest of actions is always better than the noblest of intentions. Ideation without execution is the doorway into delusion. And a breathtaking vision not backed up by pristine daily implementation is the primary mistake of promise neglected. 36. The 40 copies of a single book habit. Our home is filled with books. I really don't know of any investment with the same yield as a book. For a small amount of money, you are granted access to the world's most valuable ideas and the planet's wisest minds. Whenever I visit the residence of a business heavyweight, I see very few televisions. And nearly always an enormous library. All it takes is one book, the right one, to transform your entire life. I often buy many copies of a single book. Six copies of James Allen's classic As You Think rest on the shelves of my library at home. Eight copies of Shel Silverstein's The Giving Tree can be found on a desk in my office. Eleven copies of Paulo Coelho's The Alchemist sit on a table in my workroom, so I can give them out to anyone who visits. I've purchased 40 copies of Meditations by the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Why, you wonder? Because as English philosopher and statesman Francis Bacon once wrote, some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few to be chewed and digested that is, some books are to be read only in parts, 
others to be read, but not curiously, and some few are to be read wholly, and with diligence and attention. I'll share a story, to hopefully amplify your love of books. I buy more books than I know I'll ever read in my lifetime and my guess is you have the same addiction too. But an addiction is only unhealthy, if it's an unhealthy addiction, right? A great legacy would be gifting my library to my children. Anyway, every time I land at Fiumicino Airport in my beloved Rome, I head to the apartment where I stay, drop my bags on the floor, take a quick shower, then head straight to a tiny charming bookshop just off the Spanish steps, where the dusty volumes are piled up on the floor, texts on sale, are noted by a sign, that seems left over from the Roman Empire and soul fills the room like you haven't felt since you last visited the Vatican. I walk directly to the philosophy section, that I know so well, search for my favorite edition of Meditations, chat with the always smiling manager in my primitive Italian, which I'm certain sounds more like Mandarin to him than his mellifluous native tongue. Then I head back to my place. And I read. Then I nap. Then I read. Then I sunbathe. Then I read. Then I chill with my pals over homemade plates of Amatriciana or Carbonara. Then I'll read some more as the sunset makes the sky go all pink and wispy over Trinita dei Monti, the magical church in the center of Rome. I invest in that same book every time, because I've learned that wisdom meets you where you're at. You won't understand anything above your current level of comprehension. And you and I can't appreciate any work that's beyond our immediate understanding. Here's what I mean. When I first read The Alchemist, I didn't get what all the fuss was about. Now I read it and I see the spiritual genius that's embedded within it. The book didn't change. But over time, I grew. And with more knowledge and experience I became able to see and embrace the knowledge and experience with which Paulo Coelho wrote. When I first read Jonathan Livingston's Seagull, I thought it was just a book about a bird. Now I see it as a masterpiece about standing in one's highest self-expression. And the importance of staying true to yourself. At any cost. And when I first flipped the pages of the meditations about 15 years ago, after hearing that it sits on the bedside tables of many of the world's greatest presidents and prime ministers, maestros and gurus, stateswomen and humanitarians, I found it dense, confusing and utterly uninteresting. I put it down after only a few moments. But as I've read it more often, lived longer and grown as a human being, my ability to understand the meaning of what the benevolent emperor wrote in his private diary, while Europe was enduring one of the worst plagues in its history, has grown with me. Again, these books didn't change. I did. And, far more importantly, so can you. 37. The Meaning of Disgrace one of my all-time favorite lines in the meditations of Marcus Aurelius is this, disgraceful, for the soul to give up when the body is still going strong. Become a poet warrior is what I'm suggesting. Live quietly and gently. Show tenderness to all. Cherish simple graces, know when enough is enough, and enjoy the hypnotizing enchantments of a Spartan, minimalist and creative lifestyle. Just as a sincere poet would. And yet, when it comes to taking difficult action, to materialize your mighty mission and showing ferocious dedication to delivering on your dreams, never give in. Live by a warrior creed, always staying faithful to your vision, crusade in self-promises, while remembering that tiny triumphs made with sincere regularity stack into heroic transformations, when done with consistency over a lifetime. You will get to where you aspire to be. With resolve and patience, for laziness, apathy and surrender are the parents of regret. Throwing in the towel is the realm of the defeated. And quitting in pursuit of your goals, desires and ideals is a vicious slap in the face to your primal genius. You deserve so much more than a relationship with the experience of giving up and thereby fitting in. Sure, you'll get scared along your journey. I get scared too. Yet fear creates more damage than the actual things that strike fear within our hearts doesn't it? Forgive me for bringing up mortality, but I did assure you that I'd always be honest with you, and so I must remind you that death is in the cards for all of us. Any one of us could die on any day. Given this truth, isn't it best that we make the changes we need to make and pursue the course we know we must follow? So we know our eminence. And avoid disgrace. 38. 
A basic motto for stunning prosperity. Here's a powerful motto to keep at the front of your mind and at the center of your heart, just because you can't see a solution doesn't mean a solution doesn't exist. When riddled with stress, our perception contracts and our ingenuity closes. We lose the capacity to see opportunity. It's almost as if the fear places a set of lenses over our eyes, so we are blocked from noticing possibility. We start seeing through timidity goggles, if you get what I mean. One of my best friends just came off the single most profitable 12 months of his career. I asked him how he did it. Easy, he replied, as he sipped his espresso. My team and I were all about finding solutions to any problem that appeared. We refused to be stopped by trouble. We talk about what you and I sometimes talk about, how a lotus flower blossoms in the swamp. So we stay positive, resilient and agile, no matter what came up. That's how we won. This is why he's one of my best friends. And why he also happens to be super rich. 39. Hug the monster. There was once an old spiritual master who was visiting a mystical monastery. As he walked up the mountain path, he was followed by onlookers and those who wished to learn the secrets of his sensational powers. Before entering the monastery, the group had to pass through a large courtyard that had been decorated with colorful flags and carefully crafted stone sculptures. As they walked through the front gates, they immediately saw that three vicious dogs had broken free of their thick iron chains and were sprinting toward them. Everyone gasped, stopped, then started running in the opposite direction. Everyone except the old master. Instead, he smiled and then yawned and then did something you might find quite extraordinary. He darted directly toward the dogs. The dogs increased their pace, moving more swiftly through the courtyard. The master yawned once again, and then increased his speed as well. The dogs ran even faster and the master pushed even harder. Now he was singing as he sprinted, and raising a fist into the air, a gesture that seemed to give testimony to his insurmountable faith in his victory. The onlookers were spellbound. As for the dogs, they grew frightened of the master who was stronger. Soon they turned away, to go back to their corner. Fear works like this, I have found. Run from it, and it will come closer to you, with even more force. Go directly toward it, and it will turn to go, like an uninvited guest who realizes they should not have shown up. What I'm encouraging, with much respect for your highest heroism, is that you hug your monsters, as regularly as possible. Keep them in the basement and they'll brainwash, and heartwash, you into thinking, and feeling that they are really vicious. But go down the steps, turn on the lights, and look them in the eye. They'll look more like little cartoon characters. Not harmful at all. I used to be incredibly frightened of public speaking when I was in university. The thought of giving a presentation to even 10 people made my heart pound and my voice shake. When I'd have to speak in class, my mind would start racing and my pulse would be throbbing. I sure was a hot mess back then. And then I realized that any important achievement is essentially a triumph over fear. I had great dreams and mighty ambitions that I refused to allow my insecurities to rule. I wanted to make a better life for myself and to take as many people as possible on the ride with me. And so I made a decision to no longer operate as a victim. In a single moment, I made a life-changing choice. I went to the library and took out a few books on overcoming the fear of public speaking. I still recall staying in my bedroom for the better part of many weeks, reading those books, line by line. Locked in my room. I didn't go out with friends. I didn't watch television. I didn't play games and I didn't fool around. I just studied strategies on how to build my confidence in front of an audience. And how to become good on my feet, while presenting before people. Next, I signed up for a Dale Carnegie course on public speaking. I gave little speeches to a room full of participants. Every Monday night in the meeting room of a quiet motel. I still remember it so very well. I know this sounds obvious, but here's what happened. The more talks I gave, the easier it became. The more I ran toward those dogs, the more they ran away from me. In time, with deep practice and steadfast patience, speaking in public became fun really fun. Now, I can walk onto a stage before 10,000 
or 20,000 people or 30,000, or even 40,000 human beings, and it pretty much feels like I'm at home in our family room. Such is the power of staying with your program to turn fear into fuel, and your campaign to transform weakness into valor. At a leadership event in Sao Paulo, Brazil, before 40,000 people. On stage in a stadium of tens of thousands of senior business leaders. I adore this quote by Frank Herbert in Dune, that makes the point so eloquently, I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death, that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone there will be nothing. Only I will remain. So when you feel timid, recall the story of the wise old master. And make certain that each day, for the remainder of your very long, and richly blessed life, you chase your mean dogs. And hug your biggest monsters. So they all run away. 40. The four-figure dessert rule. The Hotel du Cap on the French Riviera is one of the preferred places on the planet for the jet set. The property is beautiful, the location is magnificent, and the hotel service is renowned. One morning a guest requested a tart trapezienne, which is a brioche bun filled with cream. Bridget Bardet named it, while she was in St. Tropez making the film and God created woman. The client was politely informed by the kitchen that the pastry was not on the menu, as it was the specialty of the St. Tropez region, some 60 miles away. Yet the guest insisted. He stated firmly that he had to have what he wanted. So, get this, the concierge chartered a helicopter and asked a member of his team to fly to the finest bakery in St. Tropez and purchase a fresh tart trapezienne. Just in time to savor with coffee, the dessert was placed on the guest's table. Along with the bill. The amount? 2,005 euros. The tart was 5 euros. The rest was for the helicopter. The guest was delighted. And so Hotel du Cap scored another win. As part of its dedication to remaining legendary. In an era where most enterprises don't even deliver on what their marketing promises, differentiate your organization by making its standard operating procedure to astonish customers and completely over-deliver on their expectations. At a hotel I once stayed at in Prague, I asked the front desk clerk if it was possible to get an extremely fast turnaround on the dry cleaning of a dress shirt. Her reply was unforgettable. Anything is possible. At another hotel, this one in the tropical paradise of Mauritius, the staff is trained to abide by a simple mantra. The answer is yes. Now ask me the question. Exquisite, yes? So the next time you're faced with a challenging customer, consider that every displeased patron can be remade into a fanatical follower, with some caring, understanding, ingenuity and appreciation. And that movements truly are built one relationship at a time. All it takes is a shot of inventiveness, an impressive amount of enthusiasm for brand protection, and the clear love in your heart to make another human happy. Like the concierge. Who found the 2005 euros tart. 41. Don't be a sloth. Real confession, my best friend adopted a sloth. The sloth, a strange animal that appears to me as a cross between a raccoon and an orangutan, in case you don't know what a sloth is, doesn't actually live with him. Because that wouldn't be pretty. Would likely be very messy, if you ask me. No. He found a way, through a wildlife organization, to help a sloth in need led a much better life. By sending the little guy some money every month. Now, my buddy's commitment provides me with an endless source of humor, when we enjoy our regular dinners together. I make joke after joke, and for some inexplicable reason find his sloth-supporting decision terrifically amusing. He rolls his eyes, justifies his decision by his affection for the creature, and then generally ends up laughing with me. And having another glass of wine. Please don't send me a complaint that I should show sloths more respect. I adore all living creatures, except sloths. So I'm not going to read your message pleading with me to join Sloth Supporters United. I'm just not interested. All kidding aside, do you know sloths are the slowest moving mammals alive? It's true. That's why the vice of being lazy is referred to as sloth. My point in this tiny chapter about sloths? Simple. Don't be one. 42. 
Ben Franklin's 13 Virtue Habit Installer. Superb daily habits will get you so much further than exceptional natural talent. You know this to be true after spending so much time with me on these pages. I've seen so many genius great humans do nothing with their potential. And so many people of average ability work their way up to spellbinding mastery. Yes, I'll agree that consistently keeping the promises you make to yourself, putting in long hours each day to practice and improve, and operating with great discipline can be hard. Yet I propose to you, that a life spent choosing hard feats over effortless moves turns out to be the easiest way to live. Why, you wonder? Because the regular doing of hard things, like rising with the sun, exercising instead of couch surfing, saving instead of overspending, optimizing your talents and treating everyone you meet with consideration, guarantees you a life of creativity, productivity, fine health, financial abundance, professional eminence and reverence for many, along with a clean conscience. All of which makes your life exponentially easier. I also wish to remind you of another primary principle of heavyweight habit installation, it's far easier to maintain an excellent habit than to restart it after you've stopped. One of the books that most shaped me as a young man was the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. What still stands out to this day is his method of installing the 13 virtues he believed to be most important for a life of success, well-being and lasting influence. As context, I'd like to share a passage from the book, it was about this time, that I conceived the bold and arduous project of arriving at moral perfection. I wish to live without committing any fault at any time. As I knew what was right and wrong, I did not see that I might not always do one and avoid the other. But I soon found I had undertaken a task of more difficulty than I had imagined. Although Franklin knew what he had to do to become a deeply moral man, he often found that he slipped. The solution was to build a system to break weak habits by meticulously installing stronger ones. The statesman's primary virtues for a great life are temperance, carefulness in food and drink, silence, avoid trivial conversations and using words that are harmful, order, practice austerity in physical spaces and perform each pursuit precisely, resolution, do what you promise yourself you'll do without fail. Frugality. Be cautious with your expenses and avoid waste. Industry. Manage your time well and avoid unnecessary activities. Sincerity. Never deceive anybody and be yourself under all conditions. Justice. Treat everyone equally and do nothing wrong. Moderation. Avoid the extremes of both sloth and asceticism. Cleanliness. Keep your body, living space and environment immaculate. Tranquility. Maintain inner peace and do not ruminate over small matters. Chastity. Don't participate in meaningless sexual pursuits. Humility. Model the great saints, sages and seers. Franklin created the following table for each of the 13 virtues, which he placed on the pages of a journal he named his little book. As you can see, in the left column are initials for each virtue, and at the top are letters for the days of the week. The 13 Virtues of Human Greatness. Every night, before sleep, he'd measure his behavior during the day against his commitment to embody the habit he was working on integrating by doing some focused reflection on how he had conducted himself. Franklin would concentrate on one virtue per week, and in this way, could complete a full course of the program in 13 weeks and four courses a year. Also know that Franklin believed that the 13 virtues are progressive. Spending a week working on temperance will then give you more willpower to become stronger in being silent. After a week concentrating on the virtue of silence, you'll have more self-control to maximize the order in your life. And so on. My favorite edition of the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. This method is an excellent example of the transformational power of working daily on your self-awareness and the three-step success formula that you'll discover in an upcoming chapter. For now, simply spend some time over the coming hours considering Benjamin Franklin's essential virtues and how your performance, prosperity, serenity, and spirituality would be improved by applying his fascinating system regularly. P.S.
To access the 13 Virtues Worksheet I give to members of the Circle of Legends online mentoring program and start integrating them into your weeks, go to theeveredhairmanifesto.com 13 Virtues 43. The Peacock's Complaint. I love reading Aesop's fables. The parables guide me on my path, reminding me of what's important and helping me live with more knowledge, conviction, and clarity. This morning I read the one called The Peacock's Complaint. One day, a lovely peacock submitted a complaint to the goddess Juno. It said that the voice of the nightingale was so much more melodic than hers. This was completely unfair, argued the bird. Juno replied that the peacock's blessing was beauty and that all living creatures were given their own unique talents. The eagle was powerful, the parrot could mimic people, the dove was exceptionally peaceful, and the peacock was eye-catching. Alluring. They are all contented with being themselves, and unless you want to be miserable all the time, you had better learn the same, counseled the goddess. The peacock understood the lesson, and soon grew enamored with its attractiveness, proudly showing its plumage. For all the world to behold. 44. The most costly conflict. I've seen people get into fights that consume the most valuable years of their lives. I know of one gentleman who took on a large organization because he felt he had been treated unjustly and he knew he was right. He could have settled the matter with some astute negotiation and intelligent discussion and perhaps a little compromise. But he needed to be vindicated. Fully and completely. And so he spent 20 years fighting his war. Yes, 20 years. And guess what? He won. And guess what? He suffered a stroke, lost most of his fortune and ended up in a wheelchair. He could hardly speak by the time the whole battle was over, but he did manage to mumble to me, see, I taught him a lesson, didn't I? Of course, I viscerally believe that one must fight for what is right. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. To stand for your principles, remain true to your values and defend that which is important to you is what strengthens your character, fuels your everyday heroism and escalates your self-esteem. I get that. We are on the same page on this. And yet, through my own trials, I've also learned this, no fight is worth the loss of your creativity, productivity, happiness, and peace of mind. Lose these treasures, and you've lost everything. And so, it's all a fine balance, isn't it? Pick your battles carefully. Sometimes you must uphold your honor and come out swinging. And sometimes you need to see the larger picture, prefer the protection of your prized joyfulness over the vindication of being right, and play a wiser game, moving ahead by avoiding conflict, trusting that taking the high road will serve you best in the long run. 45. Kill your darlings. Yes, I do remember what I mentioned to you earlier about using words that uplift, encourage and inspire. Yet I needed to use this title. To explain how I roll as a writer. It's been 12 long and arduous and strenuous months, months that have also been exhilarating and exuberant and euphoric to get to this stage of this book. Here's a picture of the granularity and obsession with detail that consumes me during my creative process, a sample of how I work on a book. You might ask why I work so extremely hard on a project, the 5am club took me 4 years, and why I spend so much time trying to get every line painstakingly right. Advertising icon David Ogilvy once wrote, I'm a lousy copywriter, but I am a good editor. So I go to work on editing my own draft. After 4 or 5 edits it looks good enough to show to the client. My answer to your question about why I am so absorbed and dedicated and fanatically faithful to the highest of standards as I write, would contain a few of my dearest artistic rules, 1. It's because I deeply respect my readers, and so must give them the best I can possibly make, because this is what they deserve. 2. It's because pushing my craft on a new work beyond what I've produced in the past, out onto the jagged edges of its limits, expands those limits. And increases my game. 3. I must never rest on my laurels, for this would be the beginning of the end. To repeat what worked in my last bestseller without venturing into the danger and glory of my next level of performance would be a formula for irrelevance. 4. My family name is on the front cover, so I mustn't send anything out into the world that doesn't represent the result of one going all in. 
5. Karma is real, and our higher power watches all we do. By working under the intention of love for my readers, and the spirit of sincere helpfulness, to make their lives better, my personal dreams will become real and great things will happen for my loved ones. 6. Our civilization needs more truth and beauty, so if I am able to pour more of these into the world, I have a duty to do it. Which brings me closer to the title of this chapter below is a photo from yesterday's work session in the little seaside cottage, where I'm polishing the manuscript, look closely please. You'll see a note resting against the candle holder, sitting close to my manuscript, so I can see it as I write. It says, kill your darlings. The sentiment is sometimes altered to murder your darlings, and is often attributed to Nobel Prize laureate and novelist William Faulkner. It's a really 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 valuable rule. For any serious creative producer. And heavyweight artistic leader. And whether you're refining a screenplay, advancing a startup, running a team or launching a movement, you are a creative producer. The phrase, to me, means that mastery demands that we remove what we believe is good or even magnificent, yet not absolutely necessary to the magic of a project, for the greater good of that work. The note was my reminder, that less is often more, and that even though there were chapters I loved in the manuscript, I had to be willing to take them out to make the book better. Doing your masterwork really is, in many ways, a lot more about what you have the guts to leave out than all you allow to stay in. Making something look simple often takes ages to do. A measure of genuine expertise is removing all except what matters. Because it takes tremendous acumen, knowledge, courage, and skill to only include what's essential. Kill your darlings, kill your darlings even when it breaks your egocentric little scribbler's heart, advised writing legend Stephen King, words I've inscribed on the most available part of my spirit. My enthusiastic prayer is only that you do the same. P.S. I've assembled a number of those chapters that I decided not to include at the everettahairmanifesto.com lost chapters. 46. Avoid the third reward. Giving a gift and expecting a return is not a gift at all. It's an exchange. What makes giving an act so blissful that it borders on the mystical is the intention with which you give. And if you want something back, you corrode the splendor of the present you are delivering. Before I wrote this particular piece for you, I, yet again, read a passage written by Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. You now know this philosopher warrior is a great hero to me. He used the term benevolent, which finally landed on me in a way that I've long hoped it would. I got it. Took me many years to get here. Where the meaning beneath the word became a felt knowing versus an intellectualized understanding. To be a benevolent person, or leader, creator, maker, is to do what you do in purity. For the right reasons. In complete integrity. Mostly for the good of other people. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with also doing good for yourself. Self-love is a wonderful maneuver. And win-win is a superb game to play. And yet you'll ascend into higher reaches of your triumphantly happy nature, enter the Edens of your most glorious nobility and experience the nirvanas of your most sacred success when you give, primarily for the sake of giving. Not getting. The wise and courageous ruler, back to Marcus, who thoroughly cared about the welfare of Rome, then the most powerful empire on the planet, and the state of its citizens, also wrote in the passage I read, when you have done a good act, and another has fared well by it, why seek a third reward, as fools do, be it the reputation for having done a good act, or getting something in return. Philanthropy to get your name on a hospital wing isn't real philanthropy, is it? It's vanity helping a good cause, and then advertising your donation everywhere you go for brand building isn't real helping. It's self-promotion. I don't know about you, but I'm growing weary of all the companies and sincerely doing things to show a social conscience when, out of the spotlight, they could not care less. Doing something kind for a loved one, a neighbor or a teammate and waiting for even a thank you destroys. The magnificence of the marvelous move that you had the wisdom to make, just give them the reward, and let go of the longing to be repaid. The service you have given, is your dazzling bounty. Deliver benefit with zero strings attached. No reply required. No applause necessary. Only then is your generosity innocent. And, therefore, honorable. And every time you act like this, 
you increase as the ruler over your neediest desires, your ego's relentless demands and any disloyalty to the inherent powers that your heroism requests that you continue to express. And wouldn't this be the finest gift to receive in return? 47. To heal your once wide open heart makes you a great master. Our society suggests that to open your heart and exhibit your emotions is a manifestation of meekness. Actually, it takes a genuine warrior to do the principled and dangerously brave work required to tear down the fortress built around a once wide open heart and reunite with the emotional intimacy that allows a human being to feel empathy for humanity all over the gorgeousness of life and enthusiasm for the magic of one's deepest dreams. When we were kids, we were emotionally naked. We held our vulnerability in our open palms for all the world to see. Yes, we were that strong. We spoke honestly of our fears, cried innocent tears, risked taking risks, stayed true to ourselves and felt safe revealing our brilliance to anyone who cared to see it. And because we were peaceful feeling any pain, that we naturally felt as human beings participating in the human experience, we also had complete access to the happiness we all are meant to know. The poet Khalil Gibran made the point superbly in his masterpiece, The Prophet, one of my favorite books, Your Joy is Your Sorrow Unmasked. And the self-same well from which your laughter arises was often filled with your tears. The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. Is not the cup, that holds your wine the very cup that was burned in the potter's oven? Then, as we proceeded through life and met with disappointments, difficulties and discouragements, we gathered the emotional residue of our challenging encounters. To protect ourselves, we unconsciously began to construct a suit of armor over our tender, wise and powerful hearts. To escape the hurt. To avoid the suffering. To forget the trauma. Yet in dismissing our pain, we also disassociated from our light. In fleeing our sadness, we also betrayed our hopefulness. In running away from that which we fear, we caused our ability to hug our monsters and destroy our demons to atrophy. And in resisting the beautiful befriending of all that we truly are, we unintentionally suffocated the wisdom, mastery and wonder of our sovereign selves, which remain locked in a closet, deep within our most unvisited parts. A primary principle in my Hirzit philosophy is this, to heal a wound, you need to feel the suppressed emotion under it. A second principle I need to reinforce, so you interact with it at an even more profound level of unforgettability, is this one, if it's hysterical, it's historical. In other words, the size of any overreaction to any particular situation in real time, indicates the depth of the much earlier emotional injury. A third here's a principle worthy of your higher consideration is, feelings left unfelt form a subconscious field of hurt that degrades your genius, cheats your promise and blocks your greatness. Psychologist Carl Jung wrote of the willful blindness the majority of human beings show to what he called our shadow, that counterfeit portion of ourselves that we stuff into the unconscious so we don't have to deal with it in the following way. Unfortunately, there can be no doubt that a man is, on the whole, less good than he imagines himself or wants to be. Everyone carries a shadow and the less embodied in the individual's conscious life, the blacker and denser it is. At all counts, it forms as an unconscious nag, boarding our most well-meant intentions. He added, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. The latter procedure, however, is disagreeable and therefore not popular. Sigmund Freud wrote to this very point even more directly, unexpressed emotions will never die. They are buried alive and will come forth later in uglier ways. To dismiss Hirzit work as foolish and to concentrate on improving your mindset while neglecting to heal old wounding and process through the pain stored within you is to ignore the open door to your supremacy and to create a state of self-sabotage that will keep you glued to the place that you currently are. All of that suppressed micro-trauma, and possibly macro-trauma, that you probably aren't even aware of, because it's lodged so completely inside your subconscious, is the real reason you might not be awake to your gifts, intimate with your talents and fully alive to your potential to cast stardust into the world. That field of hurt, trapped within your psyche, is the main reason you are procrastinating on producing your magnum opus, resisting the installation of virtuoso-grade habits, sabotaging healthy relationships, 
or attracted to toxic ones because traumatized people don't know what healthy looks like and, incredibly, a drama-soaked lifestyle seems safer to them than a peaceful one because it's so much more familiar or increasing addictions that range from too much time on social media to too much time shopping or drinking or complaining and basically missing out on the opportunities right in front of you to realize your giant promise, lead a phenomenal life, and serve many people in the process. All the repressed pain of our past also explains why most people retreat into their heads, forgetting the truth, that instinct is always much smarter than the intellect. And the heart is always wiser than reason. And since so many of us are now living in our minds and are stuck in our thinking, rather than enjoying our natural capacity to stay present to what we are feeling, we have forgotten how to sense and cherish all that is life around us. This, in turn, means we are unable to feel remorse on harming another human. We start wars that kill our brothers and sisters because we no longer feel any connection to them. We disrespect a neighbor because of the color of their skin or the nature of their gender or the name of their religion because we can't feel the terror of such violent behavior. We pollute a once pristine planet with chemicals, garbage and other toxins that destroy the oceans, degrade the forests and annihilate our animal friends because we have shielded ourselves to the bodily sensations of sorrow any fully awake human being would feel on killing anything living. Such is the behavior of a civilization that no longer associates with their emotions, numb to their bodily sensations. Such is the way of a people who are locked in robotic reason and machine-like intellectualization, preferring to manufacture more information than to grow in wisdom. Such is the result when worldly egoism triumphs over human heroism. I need to end this chapter, which I happen to be writing in a clapboard cabin on a rugged and sparsely populated island in the Atlantic Ocean, as the wind howls, the waves crash and the windows tremble. I'll leave you with a specific technique that has transformed the creativity, productivity, prosperity and impact of the clients I mentor. It's called the AFRA tool. The A stands for awareness. The F stands for feel. The R stands for release. And the second A stands for ascend. Let's look at the learning framework related to it, the AFRA tool for Hirtzit purification. The next time your weaker self gets negatively activated by a person or a situation, rather than playing the victim and blaming the other person or outer condition, begin to exploit the circumstance for training to purify your Hirtzit by working with a suppressed emotional injury and old trauma that the scenario has beautifully raised from the hidden recesses of your subconscious life into your conscious attention. You'll know that blocked emotion from the field of hurt has risen to the surface, where you can now deal with it by the very fact that it's bothering you, confirming that it has left your unconscious realm and has entered your conscious world. Everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding of ourselves, said Carl Jung. If you didn't have pre-existing anger within you, Nothing could ever make you angry, right? So that frustrating romantic partner or difficult coworker or aggressive driver who sends you into a fury is, in truth, a spiritual friend, heaven sent to deliver your growth and help you own more of your supremacy. Because they have triggered an ancient wound, made it conscious for you, so you can look at it and, if you choose, heal the hurt, so it no longer sabotages your creativity, productivity, prosperity and joy. If you didn't have old, undealt with sadness, shame, resentment, jealousy, disappointment or regret left over from former events inside, no one and no thing could ever get you off your genius today, right? As you run the Afra tool more and more, you will not only be using so-called difficulty to your advantage by leveraging every hard situation for your growth and self-mastery and turning all stumbling blocks into stepping stones, you'll also be transforming wounds into wisdom and any problems into the power that you get to take with you along the rest of your lifetime. Okay. Please allow me to walk you through how to apply the tool. The next time you feel a strong reaction to something that unfolds, begin training yourself through steady conditioning to think of the AFRA acronym. I emphasize strong because, again, it's only when your emotional reaction is an overreaction to the event that you know a pre-existing wound has been struck. 
of course, the arising of various human emotions in proportionate response to circumstances in our days is normal, healthy and doesn't suggest any old wound has been activated, like getting angry during a mean conversation with a family member or feeling sad when a client fails to appreciate your hard work or scared when a demanding professional opportunity presents itself or feeling insecure about your finances or feeling put down by the way a friend speaks to you or inferior when it seems someone is doing better than you from their social media images. Next, run the four-step process below to get the healing. Step 1. Awareness. Begin building awareness around the inner wound by locating the feeling in your body. The original hurt is trapped in there because you were taught not to feel through it to completion, most people were told as children that feelings are wrong or for weaklings. We didn't feel safe to acknowledge the emotional cut, so we denied it, causing it to freeze within us, blocking our truest power to be amazing and accomplish the sublime. At first you may not be able to locate the sensation related to the emotion because emotional fluency is so foreign to you. But remember, you're starting a new skill. Mastery requires practice and patience. Keep searching for the physical response the challenging person or situation has caused. It might be a tightness in your chest, or a heaviness in your throat, or a pain in your stomach, or a throbbing in your head. See yourself as an emotional detective of sorts, investigating more of the universe within your hirtsit and getting to know this essential part of you better. Place all of your attention on the feeling within your body. This will automatically bring you into the present and out of any worrying and intellectualizing. Do your best to stay out of your head and remain with the actual sensation that has been lodged in your body. Note its texture and sense its color. Be one with it. Step 2. Feel. The fact that you're now feeling the old, once repressed emotion that the current scenario has. Activated is not bad at all and completely good. Yes, society says if we're not feeling happy all the time something is wrong. What nonsense. To be a fully alive human is to experience a range of emotions. To repeat to reinforce, the fact that you're feeling an unpleasant emotion means that it has surfaced from your unconscious and is now within the conscious part of you. Fantastic. It no longer secretly owns you, running and mostly ruining your creativity, productivity, and happiness. So at this step of the process, the goal is to stay with the sensation. Don't run from it. Don't escape by distracting yourself with a device. Because to heal a wound you really do need to feel the repressed condition under it. And the fact that the feeling is now awake to you by being an actual sensation in your body means that it's on its way out, no longer stuck in your field of hurt, where it can create havoc in your life without your even knowing it. Just breathe into it, sit with it, and accept it, rather than judging it as wrong. Trust that the quickest way out of this pain is to go directly into it. Step 3. Release. I know this seems vague, yet at this point, in implementing the Afra tool all you need to do is set the intention to let go of the old wound. By feeling the buried emotion fully, and by then desiring to release it from your system, you dislodge the frozen pain. And it will start to leave your body. Leaving you freer. Sometimes the release will take a few minutes or a couple of hours. Sometimes the stuck emotional baggage is bigger, so it takes longer to work through it. Trust this process. And know that as the hurts of the past clear you are experiencing a major healing. This exercise will leave you more intimate with your gifts, more friendly with your strengths, more connected with your courage, more awake to your aliveness, more trusting of your instincts and much closer to your loving nature. Forever. Step 4. Ascend. Each time you run this Hirtzit purification protocol, there is a payoff, making you move forward higher and healthier. Every time you run the Afra tool and release some of the previously ignored toxicity, it's not all from past hurts we have sustained, by the way. Some of it is also from the guilt, shame and regret we feel at the ways we have treated others that has been stunting your performance and keeping your heart closed to being able to love at a level beyond all reason, the field of hurt becomes less dense. You will feel lighter. You grow nearer to the limitless happiness, unchained excellence and spiritual freedom that is your essential nature. You'll experience more energy and confidence. Continue practicing this method daily in response to any problems life sends, and you'll soon begin to see that life never really hinders you. 
All that happens is working to help you rise and reclaim your primal genius. Keep doing this here it's at work, as hard and messy as it can be at times, and the vast reservoir of self-loathing, made from all of the stored low-energy feelings we've denied, that sits within the emotional systems of, so many of us on the planet at this time will steadily vanish. Automatically, the higher-order emotions of hope, gratitude, joy, empathy, compassion, bravery, inspiration and all begin to occupy you, reuniting you with the higher power and daily greatness that is your essential nature. And you at your finest. Yes, healing your once wide open heart will make you a great master. The practice is a direct route to scaling the self-love that electrifies you to honor your ethical ambitions, materialize your gifts, treat yourself with respect and make our world a better place. Because of your shining light. Every situation that the voice of fear, known as your ego, claims as bad is, in truth, a blessing that will serve your ascension into the artistic force, productive giant and servant hero, that the call on your life is asking you to be. And as you steadily release all emotional impurities by wisely leveraging all that happens to you as part of your process, in becoming a warrior sage, you will reawaken the wonder, majesty and ability to see possibility that you once knew as a child before the world caused you to close down and neglect your magic. 48. What I learned from Leonardo's private notebooks. One unforgettable afternoon, as I was walking the streets of Rome in springtime, as I so love to do, I ducked into the easy-to-miss museum that sits at the edge of Piazza del Popolo. It had a simple sign outside advertising an exhibit of the works of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo, a maestro of range, generated work in the fields of architecture, painting, anatomy, sculpture, engineering and aeronautics. The productivity of this unusually creative soul was clearly special. As his most famous biographer, Giorgio Vasari, wrote, sometimes in supernatural fashion, a single person is marvelously endowed by heaven with beauty, grace and talent in such abundance that his every act is divine, and everything he does comes from God, rather than from human art. And yet as I walked through the museum looking at the instruments he had developed, and diagrams of the insides of various creatures, and studying, for a few careful hours, the etchings, markings and words within the private notebooks he meticulously kept, one insight became strikingly clear, his so-called genius was less a genetic blessing, and more the result of self-teaching. And continuous daily improvements and enormous degrees of discipline, devotion and training. Supreme artists, architects, inventors and leaders are not born into their skill. Their mastery truly is self-made, as I've done my best to affirm throughout this book, so it becomes a default belief of yours once you put the book down. This luminary would spend day after day obsessively and passionately studying the seemingly smallest of subjects that would contribute to the advanced perception and optimization of skill. That would later lift our civilization. He taught himself about the way the jaw of a crocodile works, the nature of the placenta of a calf, the anatomy of a woodpecker's tongue and how moonlight radiates through a crisp winter sky. He understood that preeminent creative leadership requires careful focus, workhorse-like effort and uncommon tenacity. Not good genes, a famous school and the right social connections. In one of his notebooks, Leonardo wrote 730 of his hard-won understandings on the physics of water flow. Another page revealed 169 precise versions of trying to square a circle. A scribbling showed his messy list of 67 words that he had discovered to describe running water. Leonardo worked utterly tirelessly when he worked. He also wasted a ton of time as all creatives do, this isn't a misuse of the resource, it's incubation of your next grade of ideas. Real professionals trust their natural rhythms of productivity, alternating stunning intensity with deep recovery, so that their prowess expands over a lifetime instead of experiencing a bright and quick flameout. The more I considered the body of work of this grandmaster, the more inspired I grew. The more I observed this great man's prodigious output, the clearer it became that we each have amazing talents within us, abilities that, when developed and refined relentlessly, would allow us to to offer works that inexperienced eyes would label as divinely gifted. Let's have a look at six of the daily habits that made Leonardo the virtuoso he's now considered to be. Habit 1. 
He wrote things down. That which you write down is amplified within your mental clarity. And clarity of thinking breeds mastery of production. Keeping various journals on the subjects on which you seek excellence is a potent way to upgrade your ideation, capture your inspiration, imagine on paper and record your rising knowledge. Habit 2. He mined his natural curiosity. I'll never forget the day my extraordinary daughter and I were driving home from a visit with my brother. She was five years old at the time, and sat quietly in the back seat, looking up at the vast blue sky as I drove along the highway. Spotting a group of clouds, she said enthusiastically, look, dad, it's a lion in the sky. As kids, we were intimate with our artistry. Unfortunately, as we leave our playful years behind, too many of us lose that natural access. Because we become serious. And adults. It took me four years to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child, observed Pablo Picasso. Habit 3. He was ridiculously patient. Vigorous patience is one of the behaviors of all world-class performers. When Leonardo was creating The Last Supper, his ritual was to sit in front of the canvas for long periods of time, simply looking at the painting, studying the piece as a whole, along with the intricate nuances. Then, he would get up, make a single stroke and walk away. Sometimes for weeks. South African artist Lionel Smith, one of the most remarkable artists alive today, does the same thing, if you can ever get your hands on one of his paintings, do it. Habit 4. He blended multiple disciplines. Leonardo married his learning in aeronautics with his love of the arts, his immersion in engineering with his dedication to sculpture. His supposed giftedness was actually in large part the result of intense concentration and radical innovation in many different fields of interest. Engaging in many disciplines will allow you to connect dots that few others can see. Habit 5. He took time off. Men of lofty genius sometimes accomplish the most when they work the least, Leonardo once wrote. Allowing time for dreaming, playing and living life was part of the formula for his prodigious productivity. Disruptive and history-making insights rarely show up when you're in a cubicle. So travel, explore, have fun and rest. Habit 6. He adored natural beauty. Many of our civilization's top imagineers spend considerable time in the wild. Long walks in the woods. Extended hours in a cottage by the sea. Quiet evenings staring up at the stars. In a documentary I watched about Greek shipping tycoon Aristotle Onassis, I discovered that after the stylish guests he entertained on his yacht would retire to bed, Onassis would remain on the deck, sipping cognac and simply staring up at the heavens, to work through problems and download inspiration that would grow his business empire. Being near nature is a time-honored way to relax your mind. So your greatest ingenuity flows. As I near the exit of the museum, and the sunshine streaming across the cobblestone street outside, I spotted the following quote from Leonardo da Vinci that I'd like to leave you with, I love those who can smile in trouble, who can gather strength from distress, and grow brave by reflection. Tis the business of little minds to shrink, but they whose heart is firm, and whose conscience approves their conduct, will pursue their principles unto death. Beautiful, right? 49. The you won't win, if you don't even try attitude. Such a simple insight, you won't win, if you don't even try. So often, we get a big idea. One that will raise our career into a new orbit. One that will take our life to the next league. One that will really make us feel fully awake and most intimate with our wonder. But then, guess what happens next? The voice of reason takes over, beneath which often lives an emotion called fear. We start to sell ourselves on all the things that could happen that will ensure we'll fail. We start to worry about whether we have what it takes to fulfill the dream, realize the aspiration, and materialize the accomplishment. We seduce our fantastic excitements into believing they are no longer worthy of our attention. Eventually, that marvelous and audacious idea that made our heart roar and our spirit soar seems foolish and ridiculous. And so we don't take action. Actually, we don't even try. Imagine an athlete wishing to win, but not even entering the tournament. Imagine a business manager wanting to let her team to the rare air of absolute world class but not even showing up to the first strategy meeting. 
Imagine a brilliant inventor aiming to turn his field on its head, yet not even starting the tinkering. Nothing happens until you move. You'll never become a headliner if you wait. Destiny awards the starters. Fortune rewards the driven. And you'll never know victory if you allow yourself to be paralyzed by apathy. In the moments of my own life, where I find myself resisting initiating, I'll reread this wisdom of the Indian sage Patanjali, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations, your consciousness expands in every direction and you find yourself in a new, great and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties and talents become alive. And you discover yourself to be a greater person, by far, than you ever dreamed yourself to be. And so I enthusiastically champion you to never leave the sight of a great idea without taking some action to make it real. Always remember that it never hurts to ask, the worst thing that will happen is you'll hear a sound called no, which is just a maybe in the making. Not lose your nerve when the thinking and feeling of defeat show up. Know and trust that rejection is the tuition demanded of everyday heroes to remain honest to their gifts and greatness. And that if you wait until you're qualified enough, and skillful enough, and confident enough to go for what you want, you might be waiting a long long time. Perfect conditions don't exist, and waiting for them is often simply an excuse, because you're really really scared to begin. You might say, but Robin, what if I try and fail? I gently reply, what if you don't try? And then spend the rest of your life in regret, smoldering over all that could have been, should have been, and failing to catch a glimpse of who you truly are? We know ourselves only as far as we've been tested," wrote Polish Nobel laureate Wyspa Wysimborska. The gods of advanced achievement adore those who launch their visionary venture and only reward the ones who step into the ring. You really can't lose when you lean into your heart's desires and luminous dreams, you know. If you get what you want, you win. And if what you desire doesn't happen, you grow.